Fred. Good, Jim. Good evening. I'm going to call the Board of Selectmen's meeting from Monday, March 27th, back to order. Tonight we started at 5.30 in executive session, uh, which was a strategy, strategy session in preparation for, for negotiations with non-union personnel. We did come to an agreement with the police chief for a new three-year contract, so that was voted tonight. Uh, eventually that will be made public, but there is a three-year contract. And signed. And it's been signed. Uh, with that, please join me for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America, and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, Thank you. Public comment and announcement? Mary? Okay. Just a quick review of the committees with vacancies. Agriculture, Board of Registers, a, a Democratic uh, representative, Capital Outlay, Communi Community Center Facilities, Conservation Commission, Council on Aging, Accessibility Rights, Cultural Council, Energy and Climate Action, Housing Committee, Historic, Planning Committee, Real Estate and Open Space, Voter Information, Youth Services, and Zoning Board of Appeals. And as always, you're welcome to fill out a form, even if we don't have an opening on any committee you're interested in, so that you're on file. The forms are on the website, and uh, we'd love to have some more applicants. Thank you, Mary. Uh, one comment, the town administrator couldn't be here tonight. He may be joining us online. Uh, we'll watch for him to pop up. Same with Selectman Kavanaugh. Can I get a motion on the consent agenda? If I could share off three so we can have a discussion. Sure can. Okay. Uh, Mr. Chair, I move uh, <coughs> consent agenda. Uh, we, I move to approve, I vote to approve the minutes for February 27th, 2023 for the Board of Selectmen meeting and also the minutes for the March 13th, 2023 Selectman's meeting, and, also, and finally to accept the resignation of Raymond Gottwald as Democratic member of the Board of Registrars. Second. Moved and second. Any discussion? None. All in favor? Aye. 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 4-0. Just Go ahead, Mary. We, we should recognize Ray. He's, I, I talked yeah. to him today, and he's done that for a number of years and done a fine job and he just felt it was time to move on. So our best wishes to Ray. Absolutely, 10 years I believe was the number. I think so. Yeah. Go ahead, Don. Um, I'm gonna take a shot at this. I'm gonna nominate somebody because the, the uh, just I'm repeating what I said last year, but when these letters come in, there's three people, but it's in rank order for what they're recommending. And frankly, our vote is really only if we had some sort of problems with the person individually, uh, but uh, I see no reason to skip the sequence. So uh, I move that we uh, vote to approve Shirley Knowles as a replacement uh, member of the Board of Registrars as a Democratic member. Second. Moved and second. Any discussion? All in favor? Aye. Aye. 4-0. All right, public presentations, wastewater presentation update, GHD. Dan, if you and the GHD folks would like to join us. All right, um, Dan Pelletier, Water Wastewater Superintendent. With me tonight is members of the GHD team who have been working on all things Harwich Wastewater. We have Jeff Gregg, Anastasia Rodenko, yeah. you said that right? Yes. And Mark Drangel. Excellent. And just uh, to point out, you have one microphone at that table and there's four of you, so when you're speaking, slide it down, please. Yes. Sure. And then the... Do you want me to take this? Yeah, if you want to. There you go. All right, thank you. So today we'll be giving uh, updates on a number of projects, starting with the Comprehensive Wastewater Management Plan, the Treated Effluent Recharge Evaluation, Route 28 Low Pressure Sewer, and Phase 3 Sewer Design. Um, so we'll start with the, the CWMP, or the Comprehensive Wastewater Management Plan. 
Um, this is a, just as a little bit of background, it's a nutrient and wastewater management tool. It's not meant to be a zoning plan, but it's really a tool that's used to support the anticipated growth that the town sees over a planning horizon. Um, and one of the primary purposes of this tool is an approved CWMP is required to obtain 0% state funding for nutrient related projects. So the town of Harwich has gone through the CWMP process and uh, has completed a CWMP in 2016. The project that we're currently working on is looking at targeted revisions to address topics that were raised through public discussion. So the purpose of this project is to provide an open and transparent process that identifies components of the CWMP that are open to revision um, to gain input through community stakeholders and provide draft recommendations consistent with stakeholder input. Can we make, uh, what should we, can we, if we have comments, should I make them now or wait? Please, uh, uh, let's make it an open conversation as we go. Go ahead, Larry. Yeah, you're going to hate me because I, I was around at the beginning, so I, <laughs> I made comments <laughs> in the initial discussions. Perfect. But I, I really liked your comment about it, it um, was not a zoning plan, vision for growth. But in fact, the, uh, the original discussion was to uh, clean up the water as it is now. Yes. And that was our primary objective. And then we added on to that, what would the future growth look, look like? And so I think those elements are important to explain on that. The evolution was, now we're talking more, a lot of things happening that may be a change, but that's what our focus was at the beginning. And, and that's what the CWMP says too when you, when you look at it. Yes, and that'll be one of our main focuses of uh, conversation right. today. Yeah, I was just worried about this slide gets out. Lisa. <coughs> uh, we have a lot of discussion on growth, and I want to be sure people understand that's an important aspect, but we also have the, we want to clean up our water. Yes, period. you need to clean it up for today and then have provisions for tomorrow too, right? Thank you, Larry. Thank you. Go ahead. Any other comments or? Uh, perfect. Um, so as Larry mentioned, there have been a number of changes since the 2016 report was prepared, um, which we'll be incorporating into our evaluation, including uh, potential partnership opportunities with neighboring communities, including Brewster and Dennis. Um, there's new data being obtained from the Muddy Creek Culvert Widening Project and updated SMAS modeling. The town is actively participating in the Pleasant Bay Alliance um, and the Pleasant Bay Watershed Permit. So as data is being ga um, gathered through that alliance, that will be incorporated into the project. And the town has started to implement its sewer project. So the changes that are made in design and construction will be incorporated into this update also. Just, uh, yeah, one second. Larry's going to do this all night. No, no, that's perfect. <laughs> I hate monologuing, so this is perfect. Like two comments, yeah, that's okay. Anyone in the public, too, if you want to make a comment, just stand up to the microphone and then I'll recognize you. I don't see everybody's hands all the time. Go ahead, Larry. I'm trying to help out because it's, yeah. it's harder yeah. to make a presentation when, no one's, uh, no, when it's not a discussion. I, I do want to take credit, however, on your first comment that we're looking uh, for opportunities with uh, Brewster and Dennis. Yes. You failed, but we did think about uh, wider regionalization before when we were talking with. Uh, Dennis and Yarmouth, and so it's been on our mind for some time. Yes. I'm just, you know, I'm obviously at this point we didn't go with the other one, but nevertheless, I want to take credit for we were thinking about it and trying to work it out. Absolutely. Um, and so we'll be talking about all of those components. What we wanted to focus on today was the work that's been done to date, looking at the the zoning and the build out assumptions. Um, in future presentations, we'll be talking about partnership opportunities, um, both that have been studied in the past and what we're looking at going forward, um, and opportunities to potentially incorporate INA systems as part of the recommended plan through the, the plan's adaptive management approach, and also relooking at the implementation phasing and the cost models that were developed for the overall project. Can I just ask, is, has yes. the state gotten anywhere with IAs yet? I know IAs continues to be a conversation, but last time they were physically in front of us they said they didn't work um, now it seems they're trending in that direction is there new technology there are new technologies that are being piloted um, they are making more allowances for them to be incorporated into these types of plans especially as long as you have a contingency of proven technologies um, so some of the more promising technologies that will get down to lower levels of nitrogen are currently in what's called a, a pilot or a provisional stage. So you are allowed to use them, but you have to have a, a backup plan. Okay. And, and just to clarify, the, the, 
they, will, they work, they just won't be able to achieve the goals that you're trying to in some cases. That, I just wanted to clarify that people don't think that INAs don't work, it's just they have a, a limited, um, depending on the technology, a limited uh, level of performance. Thank you, and I guess to my, my, my <laughs> own opinion on that means it doesn't work. But the, uh, <laughs> the uh, I guess, the, and where I'm going with that is I, I really don't want to see Harwich embark on the IA path only to find out later that we have to sue her anyway. So when they figure it out and they tell us that they work, great. Until then, it's hard to support. Mary? Wasn't there also some concern, I think I remember Dan talking about it, uh, or someone when we had this conversation, that the IAs require quite a bit of work on the part of the homeowner, that it's not just you plug it in and you're good. There are monitoring requirements associated with an INA program. Um, so there are responsibilities for the homeowner and then also there needs to be what's called a responsible management entity. So an entity that's tracking the progress of the INAs and making sure they're meeting their nitrogen removal goals. So it's not just a set and forget. What would that be? It, uh, so that's something that would have to be decided by the town. It could be a town department, or it could potentially be subcontracted out. Okay, so, I think I see who it would be. Yeah. Uh, well, the RME, or uh, Routine Maintenance Expert, is really something that's only been talked about in concept in the actual RME um, business enterprise or, or public entity that would be doing those services doesn't really exist yet. The INA systems need to be monitored by a licensed wastewater treatment operator, um, which there's limited of those. And one other component, um, I know we do have a few of them in town, people in nitrogen sensitive areas, and I know the annual cost and the people that I've talked to has been in excess of $2,000 a year for the associated sampling and monitoring that goes with those systems. Dan, can you just tell the public what the acronyms are that we're using? Innovative Alternative Septic Systems and its Routine Maintenance Expert, is that? I, I've heard it as Responsible Management Respons Entity. Okay, one of the two of those, but. Uh, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> <laughs> but same, same concepts yes. with both. To uh, Mary's point, I've, I've argued, not successfully yet, but I've argued that since initially, uh, it wouldn't be a full-time job for anyone in Harwich that, uh, or any other town actually, that if it were to go this way, the, co the, the commission, the county should pick it up. It'd be a big lift. Because they, they haven't agreed with that, actually, but. Uh. DEP's been saying it would be anywhere up to, I think it's 10% of the systems per month that you would have to sample. And if we built out Harwich on an IA uh, framework, that would be, you know, 700 to 1,000 systems a month that would need to be sampled, which is a pretty big lift. Yeah. It's basically you're mim mimicking the same way wastewater process that you would have in a centralized plant in your backyard. Um, so there, you know, it's not set and forget. There are pumps, you do have to maintain it and to track the progress. Thank you. Um, so when we started this project, we started with a series of listening sessions where we explained the scope of the project and got feedback from the public. Um, two of the common themes that we received is that this plan really needs to not look <coughs> just at saltwater coastal estuaries, but also to acknowledge freshwater ponds in the, the phasing that's proposed. Um, and there was um, comments about the potential acceleration of sewer implementation around Bucks Pond. So in order to acknowledge those comments, um, we're looking at freshwater ponds along with coastal estuaries as part of the CWMP, and that's something that will be considered in the, the phasing. So in the original plan, Phase, um, phasing around the freshwater ponds was in some of the later phases and we'll be looking to see if that still makes sense or if we want to reorder that phasing as part of this plan. Don? Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I just want to quickly get to one question here. Sure. Uh, freshwater bodies have a different need than saltwater bodies. Thank you. Uh, are, are you saying that the sewering we're going to put in is going to uh, take care of uh, both, both types of pollution, both the nitrogen so and the phosphorus? There are multiple sources. Um, freshwater bodies tend to be phosphorus limited. Mm. Yep. So we'll be looking, are there areas where phosphorus from septic 
is one of the main contributors. We'll also be looking at stormwater sources, which is one of the big um, contributors to freshwater ponds for phosphorus. Yeah, I think that was the point I was trying to yeah. make. Because yeah, yeah. as soon as you pave over things with impervious yeah. areas and it rains and there's runoff from roofs, and everything, you're not going to be able to get at that because that, that, that's not something that, you, that you'd be treating. You'd be treating water in, water out. Um, so we, we will include recommendations for stormwater as well, right? So we'll, just, we'll be looking at is this a septic influence, is this stormwater, and what, what are the appropriate next steps? Yeah, I just wanted to delineate yeah. that because yes, pe yeah. there are people who do know that there's a difference in the type of pollution. Yes, yeah. No, that's a, a great comment. Um, so as I mentioned, today we'll be focusing on the zoning and build-out projections. So we wanted to start with a slide that broke down um, the original projections that were carried in the 2016 CWMP. And for the, um, Harwich has five impaired, nitrogen impaired estuaries. For those five estuaries, there are three main components that were used in the flow projections. The first, the biggest bar that's in blue, was an estimate of current wastewater generation, which was based <laughs> off of Harwich's water use data. And then on top of that, there was added an allowance um, looking at how much growth potential there is to build out. So build out is the maximum growth that you can have with your current zoning. And that's the, the green bar for each of the five estuaries. The third component in Pleasant Bay, on top of build out, there was an additional allocation that was added for a zoning change that would lead to increased uh, density in the East Harwich Village Center. Um, we've worked with the, the former 10 planner and he let us know that this is likely not something that's going to go forward. So one of the conversations that we'll be having is, um, and we've started working with the, the current town planner of does that allocation potentially get reallocated to other needs that are seen in the town or do we maintain it in Pleasant Bay or completely get rid of it? Um, and then along with the five, estu uh, the five estuaries, there were also allocations for sewering in Route 28 Great Sand Lakes and the campground area. So are there any questions in? Don? Go ahead. Yeah, since we're revisiting. Yes. Uh, one thing uh, that always troubled me, and it goes back to the executive summary for that was first developed by uh, CDM uh, Smith. Uh, the, the, it's somewhat dismissive about the embayments uh, in Nantucket Sound. Uh, I remember, as I recall, the, the analysis of that talked about, well, they're man-made. And my comment when I read that was, how would the fish know? Uh, <laughs> so it was, some, it was dismissive in the sense that it seemed to point us elsewhere. I mean, we are taking a serious look at that, right, uh, the, the southern tier embayments? We're looking at all of the, the embayments that have had a Massachusetts Estuaries Project um, completed for them, which is typically the most tidally restricted portions, and that's where nitrogen gets trapped. That's an interesting uh, comment, uh, Don. Maybe I can help because, you know, driven by the regulatory aspects is our you know, uh, Pleasant Bay, uh, you know, Herring River, Allen Harbor, um, Wishmere Harbor, yep. the, and the watersheds go into that, yep. which leads to a different, and that's what the regulatory, that's what the CWMP was based on. So when we talk about adding ponds and stuff, uh, we've got a lot of input to do that, but we, got to, we have to look at the financial implications because that's, that's above what we're doing for regulatory requirements. Mm -hmm. And we've had discussions, those same discussions in the past at Harwishport, for instance. There's a lot of economic reasons to want to see our Harwishport because it would help our restaurants, for instance, a lot because they could uh, not tie into septics if they had a way to in the hotel, you know. And, uh, and I think we should look at those, but again, that's an added expense in and above what we've been building up to this point in our CWMP. So I'm happy we're having these discussions because we have some decisions to make about where we go with this. Do we expand it to not just clean up the estuaries, but also for economic and uh, growth or, or use? And those are important discussions. So it'll be a good one to have there, and it'll, it'll tie into actually uh, above your pay grade, actually, it ties into our local comprehensive plan of how we look at where we're going. And so this discussion leads into that. So it's, it's doing a great job moving into that. Could, could you tell us which um, water bodies you're referring to? 
it, Larry was right. It's in Nantucket Sound because the, the whole southern tier of the town, Route 28, uh, south of Route 28, has harbors, uh, right. but they were man-made. And it, that's, it, it kind of predisposed of the discussion in the executive summary by saying, well, they were man-made, so they, we don't have to worry about them. So there uh, are some, though, that are... But there's a lot of nitrogen that, yeah. Uh, yeah. from there, and Larry's also right, it's constrictive uh, for economic activity because restaurants, uh, never mind uh, the campgrounds and some other areas that are really densely built on, uh, there's a real consideration that uh, all of the harbors, Allen Harbor, mm. so Sacramento, they're, they're, all, yeah. they're all highly loaded. And those, those will be included in the, um, so Allen Harbor, Witchmere Harbor, and Sacramento Harbor are all included in the evaluation. Right. Oh, that's comforting. Yes, okay. yeah. As well as Herring River and Pleasant Bay. Those are the, the five. Russ, if you'd like to join the table, you're welcome to. Who am I cover, Mr. Chairman? <laughs> we'll call on you if we need you. <coughs> Hold over here. Oh, sorry. Oh. There you go. You're right. There we go. There we go. There we go. All these All right. engineers at the table, I'll be able to figure this out. <laughs> we, we got it done. Um, so the, the first thing that we looked at as part of this project, um, the previous flow estimates were done on a build-out, so that's maximum growth. And we wanted to see if we took a planning horizon, so look 20 years out, which is, we use 20 years um, because wastewater equipment typically has a 20-year design life, so it's an appropriate metric for your first stage of planning. Um, looking at a 20-year projection, how close do we anticipate the town being to build out? Um, so we, we started this analysis with discussions with the, the former town planner. One of the first things that we look at is population projections, which I have up on the slide, and as you can see, um, it's a pretty flat population projection over that 20-year period. Um, one of the things that the town does need to meet is its 2016 housing production goals. So we looked at how many housing units would you need to develop within 20 years to meet the goals outlined in that plan. Um, we also had conversations about what kind of commercial growth is being seen in the town. And what he had told us is while properties are switching ownership, they typically maintain a similar water usage. Um, so it's not going up dramatically or down dramatically. And that's what we carried in our initial set of assumptions, was a, a relatively steady commercial usage. That was actually going to, excuse me, that was going to be my question to Dan. Uh, has water been pretty much flat during the past 10 years, say? Or? That's a real tough question to answer. And I only say that because we fluctuate anywhere from 100 million gallons or more year over year. Right. Uh, we just draw a trend line. You know, drawing a trend line. I did it a couple of years ago, and we were trending upward at like 2%. So that much. Water so use. Right. And we've covered that. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so it's um, if the two allowances that we did incorporate into the 20 year projections was meeting the housing production goals, and then the second was um, exactly what you were asking about, Larry, is the, uh, the linear trends that we've been seeing with historical data extending that over the next 20 years as a infill and increase in water usage. Oh, okay. <laughs> Would it help if I just said uh, next instead of trying to do that? <laughs> yeah, good. Can you go one back? These all look very similar. Should it be the 20 year planning horizon? The next one we have is a. 20, yeah, year, 20 year trying, planning trying horizon versus. Trying to go back. Uh, all right. Here we go. Uh, so these are the, the, the three components that we use to compare the 20 year planning horizon to the overall build out. Um, the first thing that we did was to increase flows from 
the original flow to 2025, which we consider the beginning of the, the flow horizon. Um, so the original flow estimates were based on 2004 to 2007 data. So we work with the, um, to get water data and to look at development within the town to bring that up to 2021, which is represented in the orange in the bar graph. And then we continued that linear trend to bring it up to 2025. Um, we then projected to 2045, the end of the planning projection with the allowance for housing development and the increase in water usage. Um, and as you can see, for the majority of the watersheds, um, we are very close to build out if you look at those 20 year projections with those allowances. So our, our recommendation would be to continue carrying um, the, the full build out in the projections going forward. And we'll talk about the yellow in the next slide. And it's not just me that has problems with this. I blame Larry. <laughs> <laughs> Any questions while we're uh, looking sure. to switch the slide? All right. Um, so that yellow component that's currently in Pleasant Bay was um, allocated for increased density, and it represents about 200 new residential units and 250,000 square feet of new commercial development, or in flow about 0 0.06 million gallons per day. Um, we've started initial conversations with the, the town planner, but we're looking to see would it make sense to keep it in Pleasant Bay, to reallocate it to other watersheds. Um, so one example is there is an affordable housing uh, development being proposed in Sacramatucket Harbor of 96 units. As you can see, uh, Sacramatucket Harbor is very close to build out. So reallocating a portion of that flow would allow growth capacity for that development to help the town meet its affordable housing goals. Um, so those are the types of items we're looking to see how would it make sense to potentially reallocate. And then of course we would present it um, in this forum for public input. One, one question on the 96 unit. Uh, yes and the estimated flow. Dan, how does that factor in? It's one thing to take from another area and give to an area, but what's the reality of 96 units of unanticipated flow into Grassy Pond and into our natural attenuation project at Cole Brook, which it wasn't assumed at, and then into Sacquatucket Harbor? So it's a multi-million dollar project for Cole Brook funded by the taxpayers, and now we're going to trade somewhere else to throw 96 units worth of yeah, well, I think this is kind of the tough position we find ourselves in with a flow neutral bylaw, right? So those flows that were designated for each watershed were based on 2000, um, early 2000s water use, and that was what was the basis for what we would limit to be within Sacquatucket Harbor. The unique thing about the affordable housing project is where it's through the state, a 40B, they don't have to adhere to local zoning which then puts it in conflict with the zoning that our flow neutral regulations were based upon. So this is kind of one of those unique situations where we will ultimately be required to take action to accommodate the development. Um, well, I guess as, as, as one board member and a taxpayer, I'm in conflict with the multi-million dollar project that we have going in Cole Brook and the reality of adding this to it when it wasn't anticipated despite what the affordable housing goal is, which if I'm correct, 23% of those units would be affordable housing and the rest would be market rate. Mm. So how does that factor in with the state on the reality that we're already doing a project that's been funded that this does not assume? That's a tough question if anyone has insight, but. Um, and if you can't answer it now, it's yeah. fine. I wanted to point it out to the public in the newspaper. Yeah, no, I mean, this is, this is, I've been scratching my head at this since the friendly, the lip, you know, discussion was taking place as to what does this mean for our flow neutral bylaw? What implications does it mean? Um, you know, there's language within our sewer regulations that state that anyone requesting an increase in flow would be responsible for costs relative to that increase. Now, there will be an increase needed in Sacquatucket Harbor. What I don't know is how able will be to recover that additional monies because it's a state affordable housing 40B project. Thank you, Dan. That's enough for now. 
Mary. But they were um, going to be required to put in septic and be prepared to attach to sewer. Yes. So, and the other piece of that, I think whether we like it or not, I think that 40B is going to be a reality. We're, we're way below where we need to be, and they will resolve those issues, and I think we should count on those 96, or maybe they'll drop it a bit. Maybe it'll be 88. But I think we should plan it's going to be there, and if that means you have to move some flow, I think we'll have to do that. Yeah, to your point, um, if the affordable housing project does get constructed prior to sewer being, you know, along Sisson Road, um, they would be re required to get a NIPTI permit for the discharge, and they would have treatment mm -hmm. on their, you know, effluent from that right. subdivision. Um, how that compares to the six or ten houses that would have been built as opposed to the affordable housing project, um, I don't have that off the top of my head. But <coughs> thank you. Larry? Uh, yeah, I, I think, Michael, to your point, I, I'd like to move away from it. I'd like to not get into debate, debate about the 96 units right now, but the fact if they do something there, what I think, Dan, you're talking about is possibly tying that into the existing uh, Chatham IMA. We could do that so it wouldn't go into uh, Sacateca Harbor and go back into Chatham. There's some issues with that because we have an agreement with Chatham. It's outside the Pleasant Bay watershed. We'd have to have them to agree to it, but we don't know they won't if we had a good discussion. So there's some element to that. The other... Uh, uh, I lost my train of thought now, so I'll get old. It'll come back to me. Uh, we'll let Don go, and if it comes back, I'll recognize <laughs> you again. Don. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Just, I'm just throwing this out there because you can't resolve it. Uh, the, the fact of the matter is uh, when you're talking about the sewer flows uh, here and, and diverting uh, capacity from one area to another and in one phase to another, just bear in mind that the model we're using to pay for all of this is a townwide betterment for anything we do. So there is no incremental, you're building 100 units over here and you're going to be responsible for laying a pipe in the ground to get it on a road and then you're going to pay for the stub to get it into your building. Uh, the townspeople, every time we do something, the townspeople on the whole are bonding for it and the only thing that you're on the hook for is the actual builder would be uh, the hookup from the roadway to the unit. So if we don't currently have a pipe planned in a place, mm -hmm. that becomes really expensive. Understood. Mm -hmm. um, and that's, that's something we'll be evaluating as part of that, the phasing um, and the, the cost model. But that's a great point. Um, and this was just one example of how flow could be reallocated. I didn't mean to imply that. No, I just wanted to put it out there yeah. because, especially on the Clean Waters Board, uh, there's, there's so many different models out there that other towns are pursuing yeah. uh, where they're putting it in a particular area of Yarmouth or a particular area of Dennis, and those people in those areas are on the hook for the build of yeah. that system. Uh, then there's the whole, the whole point about making a coherent uh, process. I mean, I'm pretty sure you don't want a whole bunch of dead ends. Yes, uh, yeah. And the, the overall goal is to develop the most cost-effective approach to meet the town's TMDLs, right? That's the, the driver behind the project. It wasn't for you as much yeah. as everybody else. <laughs> you also have um, I, um, I remember, but it's not important enough to, to <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> go ahead. Um, any other questions on this slide, or I'll go on to the next one. Um, so the, the table on the right, shows just the difference um, in tabular form between the 20-year projection and the build-out flow. Um, so based on, they're very similar numbers based on the, the closeness of them, we would recommend continuing to carry that build-out projection, um, unless anybody had any comments that we wanted to discuss right now. Nope. That makes sense? Um, and then we've talked about the different allocations that are in the 20-year the planning horizon, so we just wanted to ask, are there any other allocations that this board would recommend we consider as part of our projections? Say not at this time. Okay, but perfect. Certain, and it's, it's a moving target. And, yeah, yes. yeah, no, understood. If I can just, I can just add one thing, too. So I know that the LCP committee is, you know, in its inception, and we're, I believe, looking for... Uh, someone to come in and help us with that. I talked to the town planner and he said that that could be anywhere from uh, 18 to 24 months by the time the LCP is 
sealed and, and delivered. So in an effort to try and not have the CWMP revision process take two years, one of the things that we've been talking about with the planner and amongst ourselves was once we identify a surplus capacity amongst our five watersheds within our flow neutral bylaw, we could break that down into different metrics, be it how, you know, uh, bedrooms, square foot of commercial space, that the LCP committee could then use and position throughout town where the LCP committee would like to see growth in town. So it kind of gives us an option to move forward and gives them the tools they need to complete the LCP. Thank you, Dan. Larry? Yeah, I guess I have a different nuance to that because I would not want you to wait till the LCP is done. Right. I think you should have an input into that today. I'm actually It'd be part of the discussion of that. Okay, good. Yeah. If we could go to the next slide, I just wanted to touch briefly on the freshwater portion of this project, um, which is being completed as part of the CWMP. We're currently working on developing an inventory of the ponds in town and identifying nutrient threats. Um, as Don mentioned, there are many sources of nutrient loading to the ponds, including sheet flow from private properties, which is stormwater, direct piped outfalls and under, uh, undersized stormwater systems. So we're working on identifying those and then uh, providing recommendations. We can go to the next slide. Um, outlining both proactive recommendations, including uh, best management practices for stormwater, potential regulations for properties abutting ponds, and collaborative monitoring of the ponds, and then also looking at um, reactive solutions such as the opportunities for alum treatments and dredging of the ponds. Um, so as we develop those, we'll be presenting them to the board. Thank you. And then um, I just wanted to give a brief update on the treated effluent recharge evaluation, which ties very closely with the CWMP. Um, it's an evaluation that's looking at once you collect the wastewater, treat it, what are potential sites where you could recharge that water back to groundwater. Um, we've gone through a screening analysis looking at potential properties in the town and looking for the, the most optimal locations based on metrics such <coughs> as size, ownership, proximity to sensitive receptors, and anticipated subsurface conditions. That analysis has identified two properties um, that we'll be moving forward with field investigations on. One is a private parcel in West Harwich um, that's designated as HB1. And then the other is a series of municipal parcels north of the transfer station. Um, so next month in April, we'll be proceeding with subsurface borings. And we're looking to see, um, are there good coarse sands in these sites? Or are we encountering clay layers, which would reduce the infiltration capacity of the soils? Based on uh, those subsurface investigations, if they're favorable, we'll move forward with a, a clean water hydraulic load test which is a larger scale test that we use to assess uh, how much wastewater could you potentially recharge, treated wastewater could you potentially recharge in each of the sites. Um, so that was a very brief overview, but I wanted to see if there were any questions on the, the project. Mary? What, yes. What would you do with the water after you recharge it? So it trickles through the soil um, to groundwater and then flows with groundwater. Oh, oh I see. Yeah. So it's a, it's a way um, off Cape, often it goes to surface water, to a stream or to a river. Yeah. Uh, on Cape, we typically recharge through open sand beds to groundwater. Don? If I could, Mr. Chair, could you just kind of identify for us which the property is that's uh, north of the uh, DPW? Or? Can you think of a good way to describe it? On, it's north of Route 6, um, so if okay. you went out the DPW driveway drove straight over Route 6. It's in the, it's on the other that, side of it. Okay. Yeah, I believe was purchased a long time ago for a golf course maybe, but long before my time. It's a series of parcels. So there's several municipal parcels that could potentially be grouped together for an effluent recharge site. In between Headwaters Drive and Route 6. Hmm. That's the back of Jane's Yes. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Uh, Larry, anything? No. No. I'm fine. Yeah, hello, Patrick Otten. Uh, question for you, how will the affluent be delivered to either one of these two sites? Pipeline, truck? Uh, like, it would be pumped. 
pumped in yeah, a pipeline. Yeah, so through a pipeline. Okay. And then secondly, how far above the water lens are these two sites in feet? Roughly about 30 feet. Um, I could get you an exact answer on this. And that's sufficient to act as an additional filter for whatever particulates or, or chemicals are in, in the affluent as it's released? So all of that treatment would happen as part of the treatment process. Okay. Um, we're, we're just relying on percolation with the soils, not for to treatment Just itself. to simply return the water back to yes, the lens. Yes, exactly. Okay, yeah. thank you. One more. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, in regards to the um, uh, sending this effluence back into pumping it back into the soil, and especially on the site north of the um, uh, landfill, uh, are you going to be looking at uh, groundwater flow? Yes. Where that water is going to potentially end up? Yes. Because I don't know if anybody on the, your current board, and certainly I'm looking at the selectmen, I don't think any of them have been around as long as I have. Uh, we had a very huge problem before the uh, landfill was capped. And because of uh, natural rainwater and, and uh, going down through the whatever's left underneath that landfill, we had a heck of a time with uh, f uh, Flax Pond, which I pump water out of for my cranberry bog. Um, and after we capped the landfill and we were able to not add a lot to that flowage and the work that we've done on Flax Pond, we were able to uh, bring it back. I'm just concerned that making sure that you're going to do some kind of groundwater flow analysis of where this extra millions of gallons are going to be pumped in and how that's going to affect the flow of groundwater because I certainly wouldn't want it if it's going to be 30 feet down. That's at the exact level where it was coming across before and ending up, you know, hurting Flex Pond. So. Um, so one of the next steps in this evaluation that I didn't touch on will be doing groundwater modeling. Um, which looks at how high the mound is and where does it migrate to be charged. Um, in conversations with Dan, Dan has noted that there are shallow areas in the transfer station uh, for groundwater, and previous field investigations have noted clay layers, which is likely causing that. We're simulating those in our groundwater model based on available data um, to see what the influence is. So yes, we will be looking at that. You're, you're right on, <laughs> especially up in that area, too. Yes. There is a clay layer <laughs> down about 30 feet down, and the clay layer is about 60 feet uh, deep itself. Right. It's a very thick clay layer, and it runs from uh, uh, Robbins Pond all the way down past that parcel that you're talking about down as it approaches the dump, and the problem is where the dump was, it there isn't there anymore, so that's kind of like we're all filtered out. I just don't want to see it picking up anything that we left and capped yes. at the dump, that's yeah. all. Oh yeah, and then we also look at the influence of the, mm -hmm. the landfill plume with this plume to make sure that it's not pushing anything where we don't want it going. If I could just add, each, each, any, any discharge to the ground requires a permit from the state, and the first part of that is a hydrogeological evaluation that the state's involved with, so it's a pretty extensive evaluation. Thank you. Um, and at this point, I'll turn it over to Mark. Any questions before we change topics? All set. Thank you, Mark. So I'm going to I am going to talk about the Route 28 uh, work, which I'm going to focus on the wastewater component. There is a water component too, and so the the big picture is that uh, the state is uh, repaving uh, route, a portion of Route 28 from the um, town town line to the bridge. And we're trying to take advantage of that work because there'll be a moratorium um, on uh, for any work in the road for five years. So we are doing a combination of water and sewer work. Uh, the sewer work is a dry pipe that we're going to put in until we have a place to to uh, to send it. So this shows the uh, extent of the sewer work. I'm not going to talk about the water work, but the wastewater work. So this shows the extent of the sewer uh, work at a prior. Um, uh, selectman meeting we did talk about uh, gravity versus low pressure and it was decided to go with low pressure which is a much more cost-effective solution for this area um, and so we are going to be putting in um, you know the idea would be to put in uh, the piping for a future low pressure system um, John Oh, sorry. So these aren't always aimed at you the public needs to know some things themselves <laughs> uh, uh, that's a significant improvement uh, for over what we were originally talking because it's uh, site neutral 
if we decide that we're going to be trading it in Dennis, uh, if, it, if we decide it's going to, we can make an arrangement with Chatham, it doesn't matter because we can pump in either direction. If you had gravity, we would have to pitch the pipe somehow and we, it, it would lock us into a decision. So right. just so the public knows that this, this is a good thing. Yep. And, it, and there's extensive savings too because groundwater is high there and um, there's, there's a lot of pumping that would be required to just install a system. So it's a, it's a very positive way to approach this. So um, the, um, you know, just the cost estimate for this work, um, what you're seeing up here on the top line is the, the estimate for um, the low pressure system uh, which is about 5.4 million. Uh, the allocation for a gravity system would have been over eight million dollars. Um, so we're recommending 6.5 as the allocation for this work. Uh, just um, provide a proper allocation for uncertainty of bidding at this time, but um, still a significant saving over a gravity system. So thank you, Mary. What's what's the number in the middle eligible SRF cost? So when we submitted our application to the state for funding, it was based on a gravity system. Okay. Okay, and so you will not require. Our, our estimate right now is you won't require that that much okay. so thank you I just like to note too on this one um, I do have a meeting set up uh, I think beginning of next week with mass DOT to review um, cost estimates one of the things that we haven't been able to do yet is sit down with DOT and go through our cost for both the sewer and the water project in partnering with DOT, we stand to save a lot of money with respect to road restoration and things like that, which I don't know have been fully materialized in the cost estimate. I know they haven't on the water side yet, so I'm anticipating these numbers will go down some, um, but until we have that meeting, we're not quite positive yet. Thank you, Dan. If you don't mind, I'm actually going to present from there so I can sure. point and you can hear me. <laughs> While we're waiting for uh, him, I may ask a question. Go ahead, Larry. I'll try to keep it short. Because you go to a low pressure system when the pipes were, were getting on Route 28, does that also, uh, what does that mean to the homeowner when he hooks up? Will he, will he be able to use gravity to get to the uh, main line? Will that require also we buy uh, grinder pumps? Yeah, it will homeowner? require grinder pumps. And that's part of the cost you're looking for <coughs> going forward? I, that is I built that maybe. into the $5.4 million dollar I believe. Okay. Did say yeah. with grinder pumps. Okay, did say the grinder pumps is in that 5.4. Okay. That said, as <coughs> Jeff is going to recommend in a few slides, we would recommend carrying the money to purchase the grinder pumps at a future appropriation because if we appropriate the money today, in all likelihood, the grinder pumps are not going to cost the same in a few years when we actually have to install them. Right. <laughs> So I'm going to talk a little bit about the phase three uh, project. So I'm going to hit on the project area, the flows and nitrogen removals that we had presented previously. We made some updates to that, uh, the cost estimate, and to talk about the schedule and timeline. So yeah, I know it's a little hard with the with the lighting. That's why I wanted to stand up here. Uh, this is the this is the project area, and I apologize for people at home that can't see the laser pointer. Um, 137, this is Route 39, and this is Route 39 as it heads up to the Brewster Town Line to give people context. Pleasant Bay uh, Road right through the middle, uh, Church Street down here. So what we had identified is several different locations for pumping stations. Uh, it's primarily we're trying to get as much gravity sewer as possible. Um, so we identified pumping station locations at the town property on Pleasant Bay, um, just east of the intersection with uh, Route 39, a pumping station up at the cul-de-sac off of Chestnut, uh, a pumping station that's on uh, private property that the town has talked with the property owners <coughs> with uh, off of Wilma's Way. There is uh, a cul-de-sac at the end of Bova Cove, <coughs> which is a town road, and the town has had some discussions with the neighbors as well, uh, putting a pumping station there. Uh, route 39, a pumping station and basically the triangle at the intersection of Route 39 and Church and 39, or I'm, I apologize if you're like, I don't know how people refer to all the different roads. And then 
uh, we have been having some discussions on whether or not we would have a pumping station on Mary Willett up in the Standish uh, Woods area because of the topography. Uh, and so we were doing a cost analysis, which we're actually going to be reviewing with Dan later this week. Uh, any questions about the, sorry, I jumped ahead. Any questions about the service areas? We're good. Okay. Um, we had presented previously a uh, nitrogen removal estimate. And uh, the important things to, to note are this, this first column here, the watershed permit required. This is basically what the TMDL goal was when it was originally established. Then as we discussed last time, we looked at, because that was like a 2007 number, we wanted to see well, what happened between 2007 and essentially 2020. So we added in uh, some of that growth factor that uh, Anastasia talked a bit about too, with the water flow and, and growth, and looked at adding that to this original number. So that's kind of like a new target. So this next column over was a new target. Then we looked at how much was estimated to be removed as part of the phase two. So that was the last sewering project you just did. Then we looked at what the, the next estimate was for phase three um, without build out. And then we combined those two. And then we said, okay, well, where are we sort of in existing conditions? And the color's hard to see, but it's, it's green. And basically green is good. And that means we're kind of, we're hitting all our goals under the existing conditions. And then when we said, well, in 2020 to 2040, there's the great unknown of what is that future flow projection? What's it going to be? What that load is? And so we added that here. And you can see for lower and upper Muddy Creek, you're still uh, exceeding your removals. And you're on the edge of Pleasant Bay and Round Cove. And again, there's you know some, <coughs> as, as the town ex experiences growth, and can track their numbers, you'll have a better idea what that is. And through adaptive okay. management, you can look at how you're going to manage that, those pieces. Any questions on this slide? All set. Thank you. Sorry. Sorry, I'm using people simultaneously, and I'm really <laughs> goes back. Uh, maybe it's just the remote. So the next, whatever the next slide is. Oh, yeah, I'm sorry. Yeah, just curious. Well, you're back on mine here. Go ahead, Patrick, go ahead and ask the question so we don't lose it. Oh, okay. It's a question. In, in your estimates for Pleasant Bay, have you considered this additional of Wequasset and their needs and suggestion to add their load to this equation? And as well, I'm really curious why the housing along Route 28, those large homes with multiple, multiple bedrooms, the largest homes in Pleasant Bay that exist versus the ones along 39 or, you know, uh, Church Street, those are all much smaller homes. Those are all going to be sewer. Why not the big homes on 28 with the multiple bedrooms and, and usage? Okay, thank you. Oh, those are two excellent questions. So the first one is, we did account for the Pleasant Bay, in Pleasant Bay watershed, the, the uh, nitrogen removal from Wauquasset. So Wauquasset does have a treatment plant. So it's not the same as if you were removing the equivalent volume of wastewater for residential homes uh, because they get a higher performance. But we did account for 
that load and being removed in Pleasant Bay. Um, so it is, it is a benefit. Um, so oh. we cost it actually will be giving you the treated applicant. Yeah, they, will they be buying it from, yeah, so they would, they no, no, they, their treatment no they would, they would abandon their, oh. they would, they would turn off their wastewater treatment plant and they would give us their raw wastewater and then we would treat it. The, the net difference between what they were doing right now and what we're getting is that 170. So there's like a difference between um, the performance that you would get at 10 milligrams per liter total nitrogen in their effluent versus basically zero because it'd be removed from the watershed. Oh. By going to Chatham, it actually gets removed from the watershed. So you get like all of it, but you don't get it at the same rate because like a septic system would be 26 and a half or something like that of uh, total nitrogen coming out per property. So it's, a, it's accounted for in there. The other question is due to the topography, and I'd hate to even flip back for the map, but <laughs> <That's all right. laughs> um, those properties, it's, as, you, as you may know, it's very rolling topography and they're big houses and they're big lots and set back so there isn't as much of the economy of scale because you'd need more pumping stations to serve them or you could address them through um, you know, grinder pumps and things like that but the, um, you'd be addressing fewer properties than you would when you're able to target a more densely developed area. So, and I don't know exactly where all of those fall relative to the watershed, so some of them actually may even um, fall into other watersheds, but I think they're all falling pretty much where we want them. But, um, but the big thing is the topography is going to add to the cost and the distribution is going to add to the cost. All right, we'll cross it. So um, the town is having some discussions with the Waquasa Resort. Uh, they would like to connect. Uh, if they did connect, they <coughs> would build their own pumping station. They would pump up to um, essentially the top of the hill on Pleasant Bay, around Pleasant Bay Court, uh, and make the connection to gravity, and it would flow down to our pumping station on Pleasant Bay East. Um, we looked at a couple different options. The town's still having discussions with them. Uh, right now, we are only proposing our design up to um, Pheasant Run. Then the discussion would be uh, in the future, how far to extend the gravity because we would prefer to have them connect to a gravity as opposed to pump up to the top of a hill and create uh, a location where we have to have additional maintenance for uh, the force main. Um, so we did some evaluation for that, and as Dan indicated, we, uh, I'll be talking a little bit about some of the timing of uh, uh, that because it's a bit more involved relative to the timing of what we're trying to do for this project. Um, and then they would be responsible for design and construction. The town would design and have constructed under their uh, contract to get SRF fund, but they would get reimbursement from Waquasset for the cost um, as if they built it, because it's easier for the town to build it and get it done as part of their work than having a private contractor work on town roads. So. Uh, and I can't speak to a lot of the details because a lot of those haven't been worked yet. So, any questions on any of that? All set. Anastasia, do you want to touch on these? Sure. Um, so the the next slide shows an updated analysis of potential flows to Chatham. The town currently has an intermunicipal agreement where you can send 300,000 gallons <coughs> per day to Chatham. Um, so looking at the different line items, for phase two, we updated the flows based on what was actually constructed. Um, looking at raw wastewater, which is based on water usage and infiltration and inflow, which is an allowance for clean water that gets into the system and is something that the state requires us to carry an allowance for in our flow projections. Um, so looking at the total wastewater with INI, 
and then also at future. Um, so future railway spotter, and then the last one is adding that INI, which is something you want to consider when you're looking at your capacity with the IMA. So phase two is... Tell the public what INI is. Uh, it's infiltration and inflow. Thank you. So uh, it's basically groundwater that gets into your system. Thank you. Um, so phase two is, uh, was updated based on what was actually constructed as part of that project. And phase three, the flow values were updated based on the project that's currently under design. And then we looked at um, Great Sand Lakes. If that were constructed, what the flow, and sent to <coughs> Chatham what the flow projections would be. And then also based on preliminary conversations with uh, Wakwasset, what that flow allocation would be. One thing that I wanted to point out is the future flow allocations still carry that 55,000 gallons per day for the increased density. Um, if that's reallocated to a different watershed, that would no longer be sent to Pleasant Bay. Um, and because it's too late to be doing mental math in the evening, if you go to the next slide, we redid the projections just show, Oops, oh, sorry, I jumped. One, one back. Um, there we go. Just showing what that would look like with that 55,000 gallon per day allocation taken out. Um, so what it shows is with Waquasset Resort, for a current day, it's slightly over the 300,000 gallon per day current allocation. Um, and then in the future, it would be a, about 45,000 gallons per day over. So what I would just say, <coughs> building on that discussion, um, you know, is I do believe the flow estimates are somewhat conservative. They are 90% of the water use, but having visited a number of the homes out in East Harwich, I can say one house in particular I went to was a husband and wife that lived there, and they had about 200,000 gallons per year of water use, which I know is going right on their lawn and not into the sewer system. So I think at this point, as we evaluate what to do with Waquasset, um, you know, looking at Great Sand Lakes, Waquasset Phase 2 and 3, I think we would be in the ballpark with our IM, existing IMA with Chatham. However, the Waquasset has expressed an interest to me to try and increase their flow above and beyond what their current um, discharge permit has. And if we are going to entertain that, as well as the inclusion of Great Sand Lakes, it may require conversations with the town of Chatham um, to see if we can increase that flow. Assuming they granted us approval to increase it, I would say cost relative to the increase for Waquasset could be borne by Waquasset through an agreement with the town of Harwich that would be a pass-through cost. Um, ideally, we could get Great Sand Lakes, Waquasset, Phase 2, and Phase 3 done. And Dan, just to try and curtail some of the hysteria that's being created in people's minds right now, how long are we talking about? When we, when we talk about these assumptions at the rate of hookup that we're at now with the construction phases, uh, we are so far away from the 300,000 gallons that it's almost unseeable, correct? Yeah. Mary and then Don. Um, my only question was, d does Chatham have capacity for us to expand from the 300? That's my understanding. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Mine too. Don? Yeah, but, uh, thank you, Mr. Chair, but I'm going to riff on that. Uh, it's based on the operator's license, right, with the state? Their discharge permit. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Okay. So even if they had the capacity, they'd still have to be recognized to, to have that discharge capacity uh, by the state. I, I don't know that they – I don't want to negotiate a, uh, a, a different agreement with Chatham right now because Michael's right. It's way down the road. But, I mean, this probably is going to take some sort of readjustment, so it's something we absolutely, like Bob Duncanson's got to be involved in. Yeah. <coughs> One thing, too, I believe the IMA has language relative to effluent recharge. I believe when the town of Chatham reaches 80% of their recharge capacity is likely when they would come to Harwich to say, hey, we've got to send effluent back. Where's the recharge site? I imagine it would be something similar with respect to flow, where if we do bring on Great Sand Lakes and Waquasset, we would be monitoring flow on a monthly basis, an annual basis, and as we approach 80% of our purchase capacity, it would be time to renegotiate um, to figure that out. I'm only bringing it up because bear in mind, we were talking earlier about a pipe that could go either direction. Uh, so this, that's not factored in here at all. 
you talking about the 28th. Yeah, nor is that factored into any conversation or negotiation that we've had with Chatham to date either. They, right, that's what I'm saying. They're very specific about where, what we send has to benefit uh, right. the surrounding That's my point. Water yeah. We might be able to re reopen that discussion, but, but that's where we are now. But it's not discussed and it's not part of any assumption here. But, but Dan is, is also correct that the 80% is partly because uh, Chatham is in discussion as what how much they can recharge into their into their embayment because there's they need enough they need actually some more flow to figure out where it goes. Mm -hmm. right. And Chatham's arguing that they have plenty of recharge capacity to go to expand. So and also I would just point out that and I, Dan I mentioned this to you in one phone call. Uh, Pleasant Bay they always uh, present these figures like they're extremely precise. And uh, okay, go for it. But they're but they're not, you know, they're trend lines. And so there's some discussion. So as Michael, you said, just don't panic till we get further down the way and see what's happening. They're, they're actually good for us to make decisions, but they're not, it's not black and white. Go ahead. So what we wanted to talk a little bit about is just some uh, design adjustments that we've made on the phase three project with regards to the last uh, select board meeting. So uh, since that time uh, in discussions with Dan, we're, we're basically at 30, uh, sorry, 60% of our uh, design plan. So we were looking at sewer depths and things. And on route 39, we were getting very deep gas mains, other utilities. So we looked at, well, how could we shallow that up? And so that was, that was basically how the Route 39 pumping station in Bova Cove came to be. It allowed us to get the, the neighborhood up by uh, Brothers and uh, Connecticut to go in towards Bova Cove and cut that off so it lifts the sewer on, that runs uh, north-south on 39. And then as we got closer, basically the things that are coming up from Church Street could be cut off and instead of going all the way to our Pleasant Bay East pumping station, we could send it to 39. It actually saves us on, you know, it adds a pumping station, but saves us on some of the pumping and, and certainly allows us to shallow up some of the sewers. Um, we moved the uh, pumping station. Uh, originally, we had envisioned one at Martha Eaton, uh, closer to the Standish Woods uh, uh, cul-de-sac on Martha Eaton. We've now moved it towards the Chestnut uh, cul-de-sac. Uh, it allowed us to pick up some more properties off of Chestnut and Elm um, and um, allowed us to uh, actually eliminate one of the pumping stations. <coughs> so we actually traded a pumping station for, um, say, Route 39. And then... Russ, will you do me a favor? Will you just shut that door? Thank you. Um, and then we made provisions uh, for uh, Victoria Road and Mary Willett that were not uh, captured in the original um, uh, CDM plan. They were, they were, because they were going to be low pressure. We have them in the project right now. Um, uh, Washburn Way was a, a an ad. Um, uh, Caldwell Lane is, a, I think, a new subdivision. Is that the one that's across the street from Washburn? Oh, it's the Church. Yeah. Um, and then, uh, based on the last board meeting, we talked about uh, Huckleberry and Sadie's because we couldn't have a pumping we couldn't get a pumping station site, so that's going to be all low pressure, but it will be included as the pro part of the project. It was a Phase Two area. It'll now be part of Phase Three. Uh, the decision was made to, to serve Old Carriage, Bay Road, Vicksburg, and Williamsburg. The pieces that weren't of those other uh, Vicksburg and Williamsburg that weren't served before, and Bay that wasn't served before. Uh, Bascom Hollow, they actually have a sewer. We're just picking them up. So it actually works out really, really well. And then um, there is a future subdivision, um, and we presume that that future subdivision will be treated like Bascom Hollow. They'll build a sewer, we'll leave a spot for them to connect, and, um, and we can move forward from there. Any questions on that from the board? No. All set? Go ahead. So uh, w at 60%, we went through and updated the costs again. Um, we'll do this uh, again after we get through 
our review with Dan, uh, make other provisions. We're doing some uh, additional cost analyses. We broke the project into two contracts. Uh, so contract one is essentially the area that serves around what I call Pleasant Bay East. So that was uh, the Pleasant Bay East pumping station, the Route 39, Bova Cove, Wilma's Way, Church Street. It's kind of the basically the east side of the project. And contract two serves uh, Chestnut, which is uh, Standish Woods and that section of Pleasant Bay, that uh, road that runs on the west side um, to about uh, to Elm uh, <coughs> and um, and then we're still having discussions about whether or not we actually move forward with a pumping station on Mary Willett or not because it, it is more expensive to do that. Um, we made a, an assumption of carrying about forty thousand dollars in utility costs for the pumping stations that's to deal with when we have to apply with National Grid and Eversource, you have to pay to get them to do a design. They may say you have to make improvements to poles or gas lines or whatever it is. So that, that's intended to cover it. We don't know what that cost is. Right now it's kind of a placeholder. Uh, we have assumed in our cost estimate that uh, all the roads receive a temporary trench repair. Um, and then a full width mill and overlay so that you have basically curb to curb of new looking pavement. Uh, what mill and overlay means is basically they just take off the top inch and a half and then just resurface it. So it's basically giving you like a new driving course. The temporary will be basically a four inch patch. Um, in some cases it may be thicker than what's already there, but that's what we're carrying in the cost right now. We're going to meet with DPW now that we have our plans uh, and we've worked out some of the depths. We're going to meet with DPW to go over uh, and we have all our soil borings now. We can look at the actual pavement depths on roads, which roads might need to be reconstructed, which roads might we be able to do something else to do some cost savings. Um, so that's kind of where we are with the paving. Um, and then we did not include in this cost estimate the Waquasset connection and the funding for the grinder pumps because we started getting higher and higher and we decided that in terms of timing, as Dan mentioned before, <coughs> um, it would be in the town's best interest to kind of put those to the next project or next couple years out. So the way the cost estimate is built, you'll have a construction capital cost we carry a 10% contingency. It's just sort of a standard contingency. The state allows us to carry that up until we actually have bid values, and then that has to be reduced typically to 5% unless we have uh, special circumstances, meaning your if your bids came in really well and the state had the money appropriate, uh, had the money allocated, they might allow you to carry a higher contingency even going into construction, but typically it goes from 10 to 5. So you get about... 27 million for contract one. Doing the same for contract two, you get about 13 million. Then based on our discussions with the town for placeholder purposes, we have, we're carrying a 12% uh, construction phase services. That's engineering, that's the resident project rep that's out in the field or reps that are out in the field observing the construction, watching the contractor, making sure they're building it the way we want. Uh, post construction <coughs> details, things of that nature. Uh, updates to your SCADA system. Then we carried 10% for police details. We kind of split the difference. In Chatham, they tend to see something that's a little higher. Your last project, you saw something lower. So we talked with the uh, town administrator and we kind of settled on 10% as a, as a placeholder for right now. And then the utilities is what I talked about before. And that put us at just about $50 million. And so we had originally requested um, 48.9. When we submit the actual application, we'll give them whatever our cost estimate is. So this will get revised, if not once, at least, if not twice, at least once more before it goes to the state. Um, and so at a minimum, the town's gonna be wanting to look at appropriating uh, $50 million. And so because that's higher than we had kind of anticipated. 
Um, Mark, do you mind if I skip this slide and go into the other one? I'm going to take a question real quick, Don. Oh, yeah, yeah, go ahead. <coughs> Thank you, Mr. Chair. Before, before you go any further, because I know some people, probably everybody here, has said, why can't you uh, put this out for bid first and then put it in front of town meeting? The, uh, it's a chicken or the egg argument, as I understand it. The, in order to get the SRF approval, you got to have a town meeting approval up front, and then you can go out the contract with it. So I, I just need everybody to take a deep breath. So it, it, it wouldn't be possible to do it the other way. Is yeah, that correct? The DEP actually told us that they would not recommend that you do that. They wanted you to get your appropriation, then put it out to bid. Um, otherwise, you take, you're assuming a lot of risk um, uh, with that, with getting the fund from the state. I get it. I just don't want the yep. public to think that we're pulling something on them. It, it, this is the the path the DEP would like us to go to get SF, SRF eligibility. We had pretty extensive discussions with them about that too. With everything that went down with phase two, um, I had a couple of meetings with them to try and see if there was a way we could get bid in hand before, but we'd be bidding at our own risk. And if they found some reason we couldn't continue, that could jeopardize our ability to get principal forgiveness, 0% interest, and all those wonderful things Mark's going to talk about. <laughs> Mary? Uh, another question that I get, because I live in uh, Contract 1 geography there, is when will this construction happen and when would people <coughs> be expected to uh, hook up? So we actually, we have slides Coming to up. talk about Coming the schedule. Yep. So okay, I missed that when nope, I went we through. No, we haven't, uh, you haven't missed anything. It's, we'll, well, we can talk about it if that's, if that's all right, we'll. Go up, keep going. Sure. Um, I can kind of talk about what Mark's slide here is. Um, so in terms of the phase three funding, uh, we'll be seeking 0% loan. So when we apply, like you did for the last project, you'll seek 0% uh, loan financing that requires you hit certain conditions like a TMDL, like uh, growth neutral by or flow neutral bylaw, uh, things that you went through the, the first time. Then there have been discussions with, you know, with regards to the other principal forgiveness Cape and Islands Trust, uh, Tier 1 Disadvantaged Community, uh, and the Infrastructure Bill. Uh, Mark, I don't know if you want to add anything to talk about what those are specifically. The, the, I guess, well, so the Cape and Islands Trust is something that you received retroactive funding for, for Phase 1, uh, for Phase 2, sorry. Um, and 25% is essentially what uh, that fund has been providing for projects since its inception a few years ago. Um, your tier one disadvantaged community um, that can change year to year um, and the funding level can change year to year but right now it's 3.3 percent is the principal forgiveness um, the infrastructure bill uh, that has that has just started within the past year uh, we have not yet heard exactly uh, what that funding level will be but the um, the trust, which is the entity, there's a Cape and Islands Trust, and then there's the Clean Water Trust. The Clean Water Trust provides the um, the loan for the town, and the Clean Water Trust has not set those numbers yet, but they have indicated to us that they believe it will be up to 7.5%. So, in total, um, you know, you could be looking at up to 35% principal forgiveness, which is, you can kind of think of it as a grant. That's a reduction in the principal that you would need to pay on the project, um, which. You still have to pay a lot of money for this project, I understand, but this, this kind of um, principal forgiveness or grant has, is some, at levels that we haven't seen in 40 years uh, for projects like this. So, um, yeah, that's one thing I would add. And then, uh, so you could be looking at a 0% financing over 30 years, which decreases the annual payment at, at you know, no, no interest cost, and then up to $17.5 million uh, for this project. So, yeah. Yeah, so I yeah. can just build off that real quick. Um, I did reach out to Hilltop Securities. Joe corrected me last time. I don't know if they're bond advisors. They deal with the town's bonding. Um, what I'm looking to do with them is establish what the impacts are to the tax rate. Um, because we don't know exactly what we'll be receiving for principal forgiveness, I'm asking them to prepare like a best case, worst case scenario so that we can provide a range based on $100,000 increments of property value of what the best case and the worst case would be should the project move forward. Um, so those should be coming out pretty soon. Thank you. Larry, and then Don, sorry, Don. Well, no, I sorry. want, Don, uh, 
Can I give you, Dan, can I give you this? I have that. Because this is what I've been looking at. This is what I'm looking at. Something like this. It, Hilltop's the one that made that. I'll, uh, I, I can give it to you, Michael, I'll put it in the stack or something. This, this is what I'm, yeah. But this is what kind of, because people, well, enough said. Dan, that's what you're working on. Yeah. Thank you. Don? Thank you, Mr. Chair. Just for full disclosure with the board, uh, Dan and I talked this afternoon about you know, part of the assumptions for the Clean Water Board. Uh, and I hope we can keep the nomenclature uh, straight because we're alluding to them differently. Uh, the Clean Waters Board allocates money from their trust fund coming from the rentals that uh, were aimed uh, towards the sewer remediation. It's. I'm pretty sure we're not going to, based on what's happening, because we hired uh, uh, on the board a financial advisor and an actuary, uh, but they didn't hit the numbers. I mean, so this year is pretty lean. That doesn't mean everybody's going to go to Aruba from here on in and no one is ever going to come to Cape Cod. So the number, the low number is above zero, but it's probably not going to hit uh, the high number that you're talking about, at least in the near term. But then again, the other discussion we had is, this is a 20 or 30 year horizon. So anything that's going on right now relative to that, to that uh, dedicated tax flow <coughs> is not necessarily the future and it's locked in. Because there will be people, there will be people who are coming. Every, the way the, uh, the uh, grants were designed, it was supposed to go around in a circle so that nobody got everything all at once. That got revisited. And I'm positive it, uh, it's gonna be you know, in double digits, I'm not. Sh I'm just not sure that we can guarantee you know something really big like 25 percent. Thank you, Don. Go ahead. So, a couple of things that um, you're probably familiar with, but in terms of the cost management that we're looking at, is we want to structure. The first thing we want to do is structure our contracts to try to stay within the SRF number that we had presented originally, or certainly uh, the 50 million. And then um, we just need to make sure that the town has appropriated sufficient funds to you know, cover that basis. And then what uh, I believe you did the last time and we would look at again as, as we get a more refined cost estimate um, is whether we need to look at uh, alternate items for bidding. Meaning so you would rank various different things and you might say, um, we could save a couple million dollars if we uh, didn't do some of these roads, not knowing what, how the bids will come in. If the bids come in favorable, then we can work our way down a agreed list, or maybe there's certain other features um, that you could pick up to try to do that. It's usually easier with a, with a, uh, like a treatment plant, but you can do it with collection systems, and usually it as you, you saw before, came down to sort of uh, identifying which roads uh, you knew you needed to get and which roads you might or might not move forward with right away. Um, and then uh, we wanted to keep the Waquasa Resort and the grinder pumps in a subsequent um, appropriation. In order to connect the Waquasa, they need to do a bit more work you obviously have to negotiate an agreement of what all the terms are, of how it's all gonna work out, certainly with the discussion about the flows, um, but it will also come down to uh, timing. You'd have to get a permit to go across Route 28, uh, which is gonna add time, uh, which in this funding cycle would, you could do, but it would certainly push you later in your, push your schedule out. Um, but that decision could still be made. Uh, the force main design isn't all that complicated. Uh, it's really the permitting associated with trying to cross Route 28. Um, and then obviously the negotiation with Wakasa. Um, the grinder pumps, as Dan indicated, because it's gonna take you two and a half years to get everything built, you're not gonna, you're not gonna need them right, right away. Uh, and then it could be, depending on what your connection order you know, requirements are another year, another two years. Um, I think it's a year uh, in Harwich, is that correct? Oh, it's two years, so in two years. So now you're four years out, and that's four years of inflation on the cost of that, and that gives you some more time to actually negotiate with uh, vendors and things like that and figure out 
the details of how many do you want to order, <coughs> where you're going to store them, all those kinds of things uh, that you don't really need to decide right now. Uh, but it is something to make sure that you're earmarking so that when you get past this appropriation, you don't forget about it, and then all of a sudden they're like, oh, no, we got to do that. You want to just make sure it's, it, you're keeping it on your list. Um, and then um, the next big step is really uh, if we're going to do alternative uh, bid uh, streets, figuring out which ones those would be and prioritizing those. You know, the first recommendation would be you would put in all the gravity sewer and maybe you would stop on some of the low pressure areas because uh, that's, uh, it, it, it's, it's not a big cost, um, but it does, you know, keep you from having to worry about procuring of the grinder pumps and things of that nature right away. Um, so you can have those discussions on how you want to prioritize um, those areas and... In terms of the schedule, so right now, uh, the schedule, we submitted a project evaluation form to the SRF program to get listed on their intended use plan, or the IUP. Town was listed. Uh, just in case anyone happens to be bored enough to want to look at that form, and they see that the number is different than the number I listed, uh, Dan has talked to the state, and what they're doing is they just, because it was such a big number, they put a lot of it in the first year, and then they pick up the balance in the next year, which makes that uh, you know, gives me the confidence that because they know they're going to be putting off millions of dollars into the next year, if our project goes up and you decide to appropriate X that's greater than 50 million, we can get that in as part of that, uh, mm -hmm. you know, hopefully as part of that funding cycle. Um, town meetings uh, in May, as you know. Then the application is due in October. We're trying to shoot to submit our application uh, in early summer so that we can get ahead of the October deadline so that we get reviewed faster through DEP. The caveat is that um, some divisions of DEP are very busy and there is a concern that one of the permits that we will need, we don't know what the timeline is going to be for that actually to, to come. So we're having discussions with DEP, both the SRF program and the technical group to figure out how that's going to get resolved so that we can give you a better schedule with regards to what that might mean for your project. I just want to point that out because <coughs> that's something I just found out about when I came back uh, today uh, and so it didn't get included in this slide, so I apologize. Um, uh, but we will s be submitting the majority of the rest of the package is usually what we do, and then they give you a shopping list of these are the things that you're missing. We're hoping that it's only that one item. Um, and then as soon as they uh, allow, we will put it out to bid, which we're shooting for the fall. And then we're figuring that uh, 24 to 36 month uh, period of construction. Um, and you know we'll have some further discussions about time of year restrictions and things like that with the town uh, to make sure that we have the, the construction schedule laid out correctly. Um, and then also the reason it's, it's uh, a little longer is we are getting feedback from current projects that some, uh, some electrical items are long lead items. So, and ductile iron pipe, so that might be eight months. And you know, things that normally wouldn't take a month or two to, to acquire, now it takes eight months or so on and so forth. So we're, we tried to incorporate some of that into the schedule. And with that, I will <laughs> stop talking. Thank you. Larry, any questions or comments? Uh, comment, very detailed report, thank you. A lot more work to do. And I uh, appreciate all the discussions you've been having, especially the public discussions you've had. It's an excellent job. John? I'm going to go a little lower. Uh, <laughs> this is refreshing compared to what we got from the previous vendor. Thank you. This is really a lot of information. Mary? Likewise. This was great. It was a lot easier listening to you than looking at the slides uh, at home <laughs> a few days ago, so thank you. Yeah, thank you very much. Great job. 
Um, we will, for the public, we'll put this in the uh, on our website under the wastewater tab uh, as an update, and it is in tonight's packet. Patrick? Uh, thank you. Um, one comment. You know, we spent the last hour and a half worried about our, our environment and our, our water quality. I'm really, I want to ask the question whether or not the people that are not being sewered, can they be required, maybe it's a zoning law, I don't know, to put in IA systems? So, you know, we have a large portion of the population carrying the cost of sewers, and then we have another select group that aren't going, aren't going to be touched. Done. And can we say, hey, everybody, we're in the town of Harwich together. We're all worried about our environment. Can everybody carry the load that they're contributing to the problem? Don? Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, Patrick, uh, if Mass DEP were to get its way with the uh, draft plan that they've got, then that would indeed be the case that anything we don't sewer, everybody's going to wind up getting sewered based on the numbers they're giving us. So if we don't build pipes to them, they're going to have to do something similar to that that takes down nitrogen and Title V's don't. Thank you, Don. <coughs> Anyone else? If I could just go ahead, Dan. Closing statement just to Mary's question about, you know, when do we need to worry about this, right? So anyone whose property is within the phase three map that was in the PowerPoint presentation shouldn't be worrying about anything at this point. We're still several years away. I don't want to see what happened in phase two happen in phase three where people are going out hiring engineers, trying to design their sewer connection when we're not even done with our plans yet. So if everyone could just stand by until we actually bid the project, that would be Thank you, Dan. Mary, go ahead. Uh, doing the math off that last chart, it looked like the earliest would be 2026, and that's if all goes well. So I'm thinking we're thinking 27, 28 is probably uh, just glad. Yeah, actually too late for me. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, connect right. I'm connected. <laughs> I'm going to wrap this up. Uh, we have a long night ahead of us. But thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Hey, Russ, mean, thank you. How'd you mean that, Doug? <laughs> <laughs> Great job, Russ. Sounds <laughs> ominous. <laughs> yeah. uh, all right, with the board's indulgence, new business A, I'd Maybe like to school. move down uh, under E or part of E and get on to the Monomoy Regional School. Sure. Yeah. It really is a placeholder anyway. So B, discussion on fiscal year 2024 Monomoy Regional School District budget. Dr. Carpenter, Mary. And uh, to the public, we are getting a handout now. I will also make sure this goes in next week's packet. Yep. I got more than I need. I'm pleased that you are so austere that you didn't provide staples. <laughs> no, uh, not budget. No, it's, it's how important you are. Uh, I have staples. I, <laughs> you took the one with the staple. Jamie, is there a direction I need to click to advance? All right, All right, let's start with a um, introduction. Sure. So Scott Carpenter, uh, the superintendent of Monomoy Regional, with our illustrious vice chair. Meredith Henderson, vice e chair. Excellent. And Scott, we want to not rehash the entire budget. Oh, I, I think I can summarize this in eight slides. That's perfect. Thank you. I was <laughs> so, say, let's let's go over what the final numbers are and what changed yeah. since the last time you were here. I, and I promise uh, we will not bring up grinder pumps. Um, so, um, and I and I want to be I, I want to be mindful of everyone's time. I, this is our this is our third time here. I, I know that uh, at least most of you have heard. One, you know, one iteration of the budget uh, and, and just to kind of big, you know, big picture of what, what has changed between the first time we were here, second time and today. So when we were first here, you know, we presented a budget that was going to be roughly 3.9% uh, increase over the assessment of the prior year. Uh, then uh, came the governor's numbers. Uh, the governor's numbers pushed that same budget and the last time we were here uh, Michael McCaskill presented you know just updating or no, I mean no, I Michael didn't. McMillan <laughs> wrong, wrong Michael M. He's uh, our Mike, he's our Michael. Uh, no. <laughs> one of you one of you two did. Uh, uh, so uh, so Michael McMillan went and presented the same essentially the same presentation with the big bold update you know where the where the numbers were updating with the governor's budget. So that 
that brought it up to a 4.3% uh, increase over the last, uh, last year's assessment for Harwich. Uh, at the time, there were a couple unknowns. The, big, the biggest unknown when last time, we, or the biggest known at the time when last we were here is they, we knew what the uh, health insurance uh, savings were gonna be. We were carrying an 8% increase on health insurance with Cape Cod Municipal Health Group. That came down to a 4%. What we didn't have at the time when we last came here was a chance for our school committee to discuss how they should handle that change in the insurance in the insurance savings. So, uh, so at the time, uh, there were some things, or, you know, some positions on our uh, on our budget uh, requests from the principals. Uh, primarily, three positions. Uh, there were two interventionists. Uh, one at Harwich Elementary School, one at Chatham Elementary School, and there was a special education teacher at Harwich Elementary School. And you know, so those three positions became a, a, you know, a, a good healthy debate at the school committee meeting, particularly coming out of COVID. Should we fund those positions and include them in the budget? And I know the last time we were here, Selectman Kavanaugh was, you know, was, you know, was talking, about, you know, talking about those positions too. Uh, we were also you know, uh, talking about uh, two uh, district curriculum positions that were in that you know, that were in the initial iterations of the budget, and the, you know, so the school committee felt that we should be funding those the curriculum positions along with those other interventionists. So, so that brings us to where we currently are. So that's the budget that the school committee voted, which, uh, when everything is uh, all said and done is a, a whopping total of uh, $867 less than last time I was before you. So, you know, so it's still a 4.3% a increase over the prior fiscal, uh, over the prior fiscal year, uh, but has, you know, but has all of those uh, uh, budget requests included, uh, included in that. Um, Maybe I, I heard you wrong, but I thought at the start of this conversation, last time you were here, it was 3.8 percent. So, uh, so when we first were here, it was it was 3.8, 3.9 percent before the governor's numbers. Okay. And the Thank last you. time we were yeah. here is at 4.3. And you know, so the school committee voted a budget that is 867 dollars less than when we were last here. So that's you know, so that's where we are today. Thank you. That's it in a nutshell, and then I can go into as much depth as you want. Perfect. Jamie, do I have Selectman Kavanaugh on the line or no? I do not believe so. Okay, thank you. Mary, comments, questions? Um, no, I, I've been through it. Um, I have the same concerns I had two years ago, that the population of students keeps decreasing and the budget keeps increasing, but I'm not going to have that discussion tonight. You know how <coughs> I feel about that. And I do think that Harwich very much wants to look at the funding strategy. Separating out the two elementary schools in our mind was always step one. And we need to find a way to make the middle school and the high school sharing of expenses more equitable. So we'll be looking to do that right after town meeting and uh, hope that you will assist us in that process. Sure. So I can, if it's okay to just respond. So, uh, so Mary, I specifically put in a slide that's in this deck. We don't need to go over it now, but it'll be there for folks. I, we shared it at the, at the finance committee meeting when we met with them, but on uh, slide uh, 15, really looks at the staffing that we have and the enrollment that we have per grade level. And we know that we are going to be reducing enrollment, uh, particularly at the Lower grade levels over the next you know, over the next few years, uh, but one of the things I also shared with uh, with Selectman Kavanaugh at the last meeting, we're also we you know, we you know, received ESSER fundings this you know, and and added positions to support some of the social emotional needs that children have had during COVID, and you know, and I think a big concern is. You know, the grant ends at the end of this 
upcoming fiscal year, the needs that children are going to have because of COVID are not going to end at the, you know, at the end at the end of next year. So you know, so what we you know what we have talked about and what I had mentioned to Julie uh, when last we were here is that we have a strategy to absorb those positions. And, and again, it's it's acknowledging that 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 the district is going to be getting smaller to you know, to absorb positions while still keeping the class sizes where we want to have them at this at these small supportive levels. So and I'd be happy to go over those numbers, but I tried to put that in here specifically for you uh, in terms of your other point on you know, having a conversation uh, that involves uh, Harwich and Chatham. Uh, I, I know that Joe Powers brought up at the last time. Uh, so we meet regularly as you know, a school superintendent and business manager with uh, with both towns, town managers and their finance directors. Uh, our next meeting is April 12th and an email went around today uh, to the part or at least uh, with the parties that uh, that our April 12th meeting, uh, Joel Goldsmith had shared that Jeff Dykins is willing to be part of the conversation. I think it was to get that, that you know, get people together. So I, I, I anticipate that, that those conversations will at least happen and, and we can you know, have both sides listen. And, and I, I know that the school district can be part of it at the end of the day. The agreements between Harwich and Chatham, not between Harwich and Chatham in the school district, but I, I sent the email that we had got uh, earlier in the day to my chair and vice chair, suggesting it would be good to have yeah. a Chatham rep and a Harwich rep from the school committee to be part of this meeting. Thank you. Yeah. All set, Mayor. All set. Larry. Uh, thank you, Michael. Uh, to build on Julie's concern last time, you've answered the answer question she had. Her, her uh, her second one, and she looked, in, she looked into it more than I have, but she was concerned about uh, addition of curriculum directors, and you changed the title of that now. You called it. Well, there, we, there. Are they doing the same thing? Yeah, yes, yeah, so it's, it's, it's district-wide curriculum, you know, curriculum positions that, you know, that are going to be positions that, you know, that supervise, coach, you know, and, and really help us with, uh, you know, with the tier one which is classroom teaching to to elevate that one that's a humanities and you know an english language arts okay. you know one that is focused on math math and science on the stem side my job is not to follow up all julie's questions but yeah. her concern was uh teachers versus uh more of administrative help what's your how's that discussion go in your school in your school board on who's you know more beneficial uh, well I, I i i i would I'd have to say that they're both beneficial. I think that it's it's you know, it's how you know, it's how you you know you look at it. Also in the the packet again, I'll spare everybody the full blown presentation that we've been doing at the school committee meetings. There are some uh, some pages at the at the back that really look at uh, our data, you know, our assessment data, and where where it could be better when we look at our English language art data and our and our math data. You know, so you know, so for us, I want to see. You know, it's it, it's a you know the positions that we were talking about adding here are positions that are are intervention and special education. You know, so when children aren't succeeding in a classroom, you know, because that that first time around the, that the classroom you know that the classroom instruction wasn't differentiated enough to meet their needs or for whatever reason you end up getting that intervention. So they're both, like they're both important. Ideally, if you can bolster and have the first time around what's happening in that classroom be as strong and robust and differentiated as you can get, there hopefully will be less need for, you know, for intervention and, and supports for all students because the students are getting it the first time around. You know, so again, it's, it, it's not one, it, it's, it's hard to go and say, okay, mm -hmm. this is more important than that. They're, they're, I, that I think the discussions at the school committee level are, is if we really want to kind of bolster things and support students where they're at, we really need to go and do both of these. And just one other comment, uh, just going with Mary's comment about the uh, funding formulas, and you know this because I think you mentioned it, there are other 
other regional areas that have um, figured out different funding formulas that is fair. So I'm, I'm assuming that's part of your starting point of what we might be able to start discussions here. Because it's going to take a while to get everyone on board with different uh, discuss, you know, different funding, different formula. Thank you, Larry. Don. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, let me start with the headline. I mean, uh, I, there are problems. Uh, there continue to be problems. But I'm not going to hold up kids getting a quality education over that because this is too late to have that discussion. So I'll be supporting the budget. However, uh, everything that Mary said, I agree with. Uh, and we keep getting to the same juncture. Stephen Ford and I were talking about this. So that's a while back. Uh, this has to get resolved, and it can't get resolved by showing up again in January or February and having the same exact discussion leading to the same discussion again in March. We have to commit ourselves to start talking about some fundamental solutions to this, and uh, I would say that that should probably start in June. It, I wouldn't limit, in my own mind, I wouldn't limit it to just another uh, formula change because I know there are towns that do it differently, but I'd I think everything should be on the table because if it is indeed shrinking in both towns, maybe another solution is to start talking about bringing in another, another partner. But I mean, something's got to be done to amortize the overhead cost of producing that education. And it can't be done at the 11th hour every year. Thank you. Um, Suckman Cavanaugh couldn't be here tonight. She shared earlier today that uh, she had wished that the school committee had voted one curriculum director not bringing two in. Meredith, you and I had a great conversation earlier. Um, I would just ask you to share some of your thoughts. Um, first, explain to the public who Mark is, because you already have one curriculum director, and now we're aiming towards three. Uh, and this ultimately is up to the voters in town to decide whether or not they support it or not. So you have one. I'd like to understand why not why you're going to three because I think I understand now why you're going to three um, but if you look at DY which um, we should probably not compare ourselves to DY or Nauset they don't have three curriculum directors so what's Mark going to do if we bring in these two and then what would the school committee do uh, you mentioned you know to assess this before next year to see if it's working and, and to see if we need all these positions go ahead so right now, and please correct me if no. I'm wrong, <laughs> right now it's just Mark Smith who is the curriculum director for the entire district. The plan is to bring in these two curriculum positions, one being a STEM position which would cover the math and science, and one being the humanities which would cover ELA and social studies. And they would be responsible for supporting the tier one instruction for grades five to 12. And while that's happening, Mark Smith would then focus on all content areas in the pre-K to grade four grades. Um, I think that, just to piggyback off what Scott was saying, um, if you look at the data for the elementary schools that have had um, a coaching model with our new ELA curriculum that we um, purchased, three years ago, second year, ago. Second year um, being implemented, the growth that the students are making <coughs> is exceptional. We want it to be more, um, so we'll continue to strengthen that tier one, um, but I think that using that coaching and supportive model in the grades five to 12 is what we need to look at because what we've been doing is incorporating more of that intervention model and um, you know supporting beyond the tier one and I think that taking the approach with these two curriculum positions to support that tier one will strengthen the instruction of the classroom and then we will hopefully see that in the data but as a school committee I think that you know it's twofold I think we need to really make sure as we go into this next school year that as, our, as we look at the needs of our students that we're really making sure that all of these support positions that have come to be mostly since, S, since COVID using ESSER funds but now we're additionally adding a few more in this budget um, are all necessary to support the growth of our students. And, and then twofold to, to make sure that these new curriculum positions 
are supporting that tier one instruction from grades K to 12. And we are seeing growth and you know, the students gaining achievement as this is happening. And that the, the staff is being able to reflect on what their instruction is and to make it better for the students. Because the bottom line is that you know, we're making sure that you know, the students are getting exactly what they need and the support that they need. And sometimes that goes through the instruction of the teacher. Also, in the, uh, again, in, in the packet uh, that I gave you, uh, page 30 or slide 30 has, has a, you know, a breakdown of you know, how many students per administrator that, you know, that, that gets in and works with teachers. You know, so principals, assistant principals, curriculum folk. You know, Monomoy has always operated as the leanest machine on Cape Cod when it comes to administration. Adding two people continues to have us be the leanest administrative group. It, but it at least positions us with enough administrative support to go and you know, move the needle to you know to provide the coaching and support that's really needed at the tier at the tier one or classroom level. Thank you, sir. Uh, Larry, anything further? No, I think you've answered my question because I, I, I didn't want to ask this because it sounds like a negative, uh, too, too negative, but uh, I was just wondering what percent of the total staff are, are in fact teachers? What per, it's, I, the, you know, out of, we have, uh, I, you know, roughly 350 staff and, you know, and of that uh, we have 11 people that would be Principals, that, that assistant principals, teachers. curriculum folk. Okay. Don, anything further? Yeah, for if, if we're talking percentages, then uh, staff would include custodians too. Right. So right. that wasn't his question. His question is what the percentage of teachers to the total is. So uh, you know, so of teachers, we have uh, uh, at Monomoy this year 166 teachers. You know, so and then there are 11. Yeah, you know, principal assistant, principal curriculum, and our curriculum coordinator. If you're looking at that breakdown, so the number in front of a kid is 160 something. Okay. Mary, anything further? Thank you. Um, well, while you're still sitting there, yeah. um, next topic. Anyone on the board have anything on discussion on proposed changes to Monmo Regional School District uh, agreement? No. No. Late now. All set. All set. I can I can give you just a quick update Perfect. that I shared with the, I shared with the board. Uh, we received feedback from Desi last week, late last week. Um, uh, some of the requests that Desi have had, I think, go further beyond just, uh, or some of the suggestions that they have go beyond just the the scope that we've talked about on changing the names and or, or in, including Monomoy and you know select board and you know you know cleaning up the language and removing obsolete things uh, you know, so we have been pushing back on Desi are are these suggestions or are these requests um, and you know waiting you know so we're waiting to hear back this depending on what the response is from Desi we may uh, reach out and say you know, that this should be tabled indefinitely is there any harm in going forward with what we've already done and bringing back next year another change? So that well, we I, th I I think I think at the end of the day, it, it involves it involves Desi signing okay. you know signing off too. So even if both towns were to approve, okay. but but Desi's saying the commissioner is not in a position to sign. You know, so uh, I'm, we're still waiting to get uh, you know to to have the loop closed on okay. uh, are are the suggestions must-haves or the suggestions nice-to-haves and, and you can imagine you have a long document that's created by lawyers and you have a different lawyer team legal team look at it you know they it's like well I would have rewritten this section this way or this section that way okay Don thank you mr. chair the reason I said it's a little late now is because it's a little late now I might gift uh, the commissioner a, a clock because uh, Chatham's already approved you know, the language for this if we if if we pull back and say, well, if Desi uh, has more comments, maybe we should wait to listen to him. You've lost this town meeting entirely. 
he I, rec he I, 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 I realize that. <laughs> no, I want everybody else to realize that. I mean, if we don't go forward with this, we're not going to come up with any change to the agreement. But there's Mary, nothing ahead. substantive right, in it. Right, it's getting rid of old language right. and changing words. I think it would be there's great, nothing. but he has to sign it. Right. <laughs> right. So okay. not, it won't change how you operate. Right. I, and, and, I, and I don't want to. I, I don't want to stand up before a town meeting and say, I've been telling you all along that it's only, you know, it's only you know, right. updating the the agreement and getting rid of obsolete language. And have you know, oh by the way here are ten other things that have substance. Well, that brings up a question though. Uh, at what point do you have certainty? Because uh, pretty soon you've got to be talking about a uh, recommendation I, from the school committee. I, they I might talk they, about indefinite postponement. Right. They they know that there needs to be certainty in the next few days. You know so. Chatham's deadline's earlier than ours. Well, right. they already, already put theirs to bed. All right. Thank you again. Thanks. Appreciate it. Thank you both. Karen, we might have a question for you, Scott. I'm not sure yet, but. Yeah, I just have a question for you. Um, going back to the first part, this is for Sharon Fleeker. Okay. Um, how many children, well, let me start. There has always been a, a definition difference between um, special ed and learning disabilities. How many children do you have in the, in the whole school system that you would say have a learning disability? Scott, you'll have to get, Dr. Carpenter, you'll have to go back to the mic. <laughs> we'll One of the two. It. We'll share it. I, I mean, I can look up the number, but, uh, so it's published on the, the DESE website. Roughly, you know, in the neighborhood, you know, in the neighborhood about 20% of the students. So to get, to get a special education accommodation, you have to have a, a, a recognized learning disability um, but but there are there are many many children who don't have learning disabilities when we, when we like one of the or two of the positions that we were just talking about these interventionists are people that would be working with children who may struggle but not have a recognized learning disability and you know, and so these roles are roles that that would be working with Everybody, not just tw all the right, 20 percent. All right, so, all right, <laughs> so that 20 percent, you, you make it sound like not just them, because their learning needs with a learning disability is very, very different from somebody that has a special need. And without a teacher that knows how to teach kids with learning disabilities, you're going to lose them. And I really think that at some of these positions, you need to have somebody that can teach children with learning disabilities, and you need that from first grade on up. You can't start at fifth, you can't start it in junior high, but it doesn't even sound like you say, oh, there's only 20%, only those 20%. For those 20%, it means an awful lot. And they are not gonna make it without a teacher that can actually work with learning disabilities. That, and that's been, that's pretty well been proven. So I don't know where you're sitting, you know, I, I can see you need two people, but one of them should be for somebody that is, is educated in learning disabilities. I, I can't imagine having any school system where you don't have that today. We, 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 have, sorry, we, we have a lot of special education teachers, so. so I'm not talking special education, I'm talking children with learning disabilities. Children that have trouble with either letters or numbers or auditory integration. I'm not talking, I don't want to get into <laughs> to IQ levels, but at one time, somebody with a learning disability had at least an average to above average IQ. There are children that have less of that, and their needs are going to be different than those kids with learning disabilities. Yeah, so so we, we do have special education teachers Dr. Carpenter, just get closer to the mic, please. And then Sharon, let, let him finish before so, you. So, so I, 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 I think we're saying the same, th same thing. So we, have, so we have special education teachers that, that cover a range of different learning disabilities. So, you know, so there are children who, you know, who may, you know, may have academic success in math, but, are com you know, but, but struggle in English language arts because of dyslexia. So we have special education teachers that that is more of their forte. 
and we have special education teachers who have, you know, whose forte is to work with children that have extreme cognitive <coughs> delays. You know, so, so, so I think, I, I know when, when I went to high school, and, and when I was in school, there, you know, in a, in a high school the size that we have, there might have been a single you know, teacher for special education. We have multiple uh, you know, teachers, and we and they are, you know, they work with different groups of kids based on what that specific challenge that the child has. And I, I hate to cut you both yeah. off, but we got to move this yeah. along. Yeah. All right. But so you're saying you do have somebody that teaches children with dyslexia? We we do. Okay. All right. That was my question. And Scott, if, if Dr. Carpenter, if Sharon had more questions, she can call you. Absolutely. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. All right, moving on to the discussion on annual town meeting petition articles. Thank and you, before Scott. we get started, I would say um, I'm going to let the petitioners a, 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 a brief time, um, up to five minutes, to explain their petition article. And then I'll allow people in the public to speak. But if the person in front of you says it, you could just get up and say, I agree. Um, we don't need to have everybody saying the same thing if that's going to be the case. This is not, these are going to be on the warrant at town meeting regardless of what we decide. Tonight we're either, we're going to vote to either support them or not ourselves. But petition articles by law are on the town meeting warrant and will be debated on town meeting floor. So with that I will start with the prohibit balloons uh, petition article. Yes, hello, uh, Patrick Otten from uh, East Harwich. So I am the citizen that had brought forth this citizen's petition to uh, prohibit the distribution, use, and sale of lighter-than-air balloons within the town of Harwich. The bylaw that I've cited for this petition is an exact copy of exactly what Orleans has on the books and as well as what Chatham has on the books. So neither, neither Orleans nor Chatham permits balloons uh, within town property. I'm suggesting that Harwich also picks this up. We are all aware that the improper disposal of balloons and restraining attachments often release to drift away, not properly disposed of, are a significant, well-documented hazard to wildlife and marine life. Have you heard of the term, just came out, I just ran across this, plastiosis? P-L-A-S-T-I-O-S-I-S. -S. That is now defined as the diseases caused by the ingestion of plastic, which affects marine mammals, birds, and fish. So I'm urging that, given our sensitivity to the environment in which we live, that we are surrounded by oceans, our fresh waters, that you do support this petition to prohibit the sale, use, and distribution of lighter than air balloons within the town of Harwich. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you, Patrick. Anyone in the public wish to comment on this petition article? Go to the board. Larry? Uh, thank you, Patrick. I may miss a lot of parties, but how many balloons do you think we use in Harwich? I don't, I don't see them uh, that as being a, uh, a large number to raise a concern. I don't have a count, but I can show you pictures of the balloons picked up on Lower Cape beaches, and I'll bring in as many as you wish to count, okay, including their strings, which also are a danger to birds as well. So. That's it for me. Don? Thank you, Mr. Chair. I mean, I'm familiar with most of what Patrick is saying. The, uh, it, the problem I see here is if you felt very, if you felt strongly enough and wanted to ban the sale of them, I could see how you could monitor that. If you felt very strongly and you wanted to uh, monitor, uh, prohibit the sale and distribution, I could see how you could possibly uh, monitor that. But I can't see how you could possibly get to sale, distribution, and use, and, and actually enforce that. So uh, I just think it's a it's problematic because it's it's so ambitious yes and it needs to be but um, you know there'll be public 
awareness, public education, as we become more of aware of what's happening with the balloons and where they're going, people will fall in line, just like stop signs. You know, we all stop at stop signs now. So it too, <laughs> okay, most of us. But, you know, the same thing as public awareness grows and we become more conscious of our behaviors, it'll take effect. Mary. Um, I understand it, and I know my husband sees them out on his boat, so I, I get that. But I don't see how we can enforce this. People that know about the situation only have them inside and dispose properly. I just don't see this as enforceable. Thank you, Mary. I'd be looking for a uh, board member to make a positive motion on this because we have to make a positive motion to support it or not support it. Um, we cannot make a negative motion. So It's already been placed, though, correct? Uh, what's that? It's already been placed on the warrant. It's going to be on the warrant, so it's only a matter of whether we support, support or it or not. And I will go to uh, Mr. Kakunis first. Um, well, I'm going to get up and I'm against all the bans, but one of the things about this particular one as far as balloons go uh, everybody, uh, certainly on the board, and I'm sure people watching at home, know that litter is one of my biggest pet thieves. I think the fine for littering should be $10,000 and five years imprisonment, personally. I think the town should be looking at, if you're certainly concerned, as I am, about the balloons ending up out in the ocean, and not only the balloons, but as the gentleman said, the strings, we should have a town bylaw that prohibits the release of balloons. Because that's where the majority of these come from, not accidentally by a five-year-old carrying it out of stop and shop. But when you get a group of people who show up at the site of where their loved one has died in a car accident and they release 15, 20, 30 white balloons, I understand it. It's an emotional thing. It's fine. It's littering. Period. It's littering. It's just as bad as throwing a cigarette out on the traffic on the highway. You know, it's prohibited, and it should be prohibited. The release of the balloons should be pro prohibited, period. And that, will hopefully, will cut down a lot. Uh, again, I, you know, I know people deal with, with sadness and death and even happiness, weddings. Why they release 15, 20, 30 white balloons at a wedding is beyond my belief. I have no idea. It's littering. So if we could somehow attach this gentleman's concerns to a littering bylaw, I'd be 100% behind that. Thank you. Um, go ahead, Don. Yeah, Mr. Chair, we've discussed this earlier. So I'm going to make a positive motion, and uh, hopefully we'll get a second to discuss and then vote. So I move that we accept and adopt uh, this article for, on the town meeting warrant. Second. Okay, it's been moved and seconded. Um, I will go any further discussion. All in favor? Opposed? Opposed. Four zero opposed. Thank you, Patrick. Should I keep track you. of that for Joe? What Leo I'm, said, I'm though, is probably a good thought for, for you to consider in the future. All right. Next is plastic reduction ban. Good evening. My name is Bonnie Bridges. I'm a year-round Harwich resident and a petitioner of the plastic reduction article. This article will eliminate plastic takeout containers for food as well as plastic cutlery. Behavioral change and alternative reusable products are what this ban advocates. Plastic affects human and environmental health throughout its life cycle from production to consumption to disposal. At production, plastic as a petroleum-based product is directed, directly tied to greenhouse emissions. Emissions are tied to human health and heightened levels of cancer in areas where, where plastic is manufactured. You might be aware of Cancer Alley in Louisiana where plastics, plastic manufacturing plants release toxic gases, and now the um, Justice Department is suing those, those manufacturers. At consumption, plastic leaches chemicals into our water and food, especially when that plastic is exposed to fatty substances, heat, or light. These chemicals have been linked to cardiovascular disease, reproductive, and developmental disorders. 
at disposal, plastic recycling is a myth. <clears throat> Very little is recycled. Estimates are that 9% overall and the majority, 79%, is landfilled or enters the environment through other channels. The remainder is recinerated and landfilled, affecting the air we breathe and the water we drink. Landfill plastic will at best photodegrade to microplastic. It will never go away. We need to regulate the production of single-use plastic, not the disposal that is littering and recycling. Note that the discussion of plastic, dis plastic disposal is often the focus, but it is only one of the impacts of plastic. Focusing on dis discard does not consider the long-lasting and existential threat of, you, of I, this product. Can I just ask that you reel it in a little bit? It's, it really is about the ban, and, and I think you've hit on the points but we can't go on all night on this. Okay, it's, it's reduction, not banning. Um, I would just like to mention a couple of, um, <clears throat> of uh, sorry, of um, statistics that 80% of all trash removed from the oceans is plastic, and that also applies to our beaches. Half of all plastic ever manufactured has been made in the last 15 years. Recently, plastic has been found in human blood, in the placenta, and the lung tissue. Takeout boxes and containers make up a considerable part of municipal solid waste, nearly with 30% of the total generation as recently as 2018. The intention of this plastic reduction article is to create behavioral change so that our communities relearn how to be less dependent on single-use products. There are reusable solutions. The transition will be impactful both in implementation and outcome. However, we cannot continue to subsidize short-term profits with long-term costs to human and environmental health and well-being. The challenge of implementing change exists, but we need to take this step now. Convenience is a price we and our, our environment cannot afford. In the words of Good Jane Goodall, you cannot get through a single day with ha without having an impact on this world around you. What you do makes a difference, and you have to decide what kind of a difference you want to make. I'm asking you to vote yes on this article. Thank you. Anyone in the public wish to speak on this? Larry? Uh, yeah, I can't support it. I can't support it because uh, it's, over, it's an overly broad band in my mind. Uh, we, do, uh, we, we do actually like some conveniences, and to, I'd much rather have education. You're, you speak to a, to a good cause, but uh, to try to ban it, uh, I'm not sure that's possible or productive you know, without uh, alternatives because there's still a lot of conveniences. And so I'd like to move in that direction, but uh, th this is too much for me, I'm afraid. There are alternatives. They, they exist. And if any of you have been to Max Seafood, you know that his takeout is, it has no plastic. Let me finish with the board, and then you can respond to I beg your pardon. Thing. Sure. Don? Thank you, Mr. Chair. I'm probably going to get outvoted, but uh, I, I do support this. I, I have both a dump sticker and I uh, get trash pickup along with recycling pickup. They don't even accept uh, the, what would commonly be known as uh, polyfoam, but it's really polystyrene uh, uh, clam shell uh, takeouts uh, because they're not recyclable. I mean, they're, they're, what, when you wind up with them, they're just literally trash. Uh, at some point in time, we just can't keep buying stuff to get rid of it. Uh, I'm not sure that there aren't alternatives. I mean, I, I had a food store, and I know that there's cardboard uh, containers that can do the same job but as I said I'm not going I'm probably not going to prevail but I think it's a good idea for people to have a discussion about this because it's just not something if they think it's getting recycled I don't care where they're putting it it's not thank you Don Mary um, yeah I I hear you Don but I'm I'm with Larry that this is just too overly broad and it I think it puts a big burden on our restaurants who have already been challenged 
uh, through the pandemic, as a lot of businesses have. And I'm seeing some of them that do now use a, um, I don't know, it's not cardboard, but it's some type of paper, almost like the stuff eggs come in, that kind of paper. So I applaud that, and I would vote for more education, but I'm, I'm not up for this type of ban. Thank, thank you, Mary, for mentioning the restaurants. I've received dozens of calls from restaurants, and they're asking for a break. Coming out of the pandemic, they're all in tough shape. Food costs, they're all in tough shape. And this does put an overburden on them. And we seem to be living in a, if I don't like it, ban it society. And, and, the, and the plastic um, water bottles, uh, that ban that went through, it, it didn't take plastic water bottles out of our trash stream. Everybody drives to Hyannis and buys them at BJ's now. It took money away from our grocery store and convenience away from our visitors. But they're still bringing them here. They're still using them. And, and I believe this fight belongs on the state level or the federal level, not on the town level and it's singling out our businesses and hurting our businesses. So I wouldn't support this either. I'll give you a, a brief moment to respond and then I'm gonna go to vote from the board. Um, I just feel that you are looking at the short term um, it, it, convenience again. We think of, think of a few years ago where we had um, milk, the milkman delivered milk uh, and he would pick up at the same time he'd pick up the bottles that had been had been used and would bring new ones. So this, this can be done, and it, it, is, it is being thought about and considered in many, many societies. But there are alternatives, and it's sort of like if there's a demand, the eternal, alternatives will show up. And it's such a wonderful cause, be getting rid of this, of this poison. We really don't have any place to put it, and we're breathing it and, and eating it. Thank you. Thank you. I know of the practice that's being introduced on Martha's Vineyard in which takeout utensils are, are, are glass or, and you take out your, your food in this takeout container, you eat your food at home or wherever it is, and then you return that container. It is then washed and reused again for the next customer, very similar to what Bonnie was just suggesting about the old habit of milk bottles. Yes, get your milk in the bottle, use it, put the bottle back out, it's reused, and again and again. So that's a current habit right now that's in, in use in Martha's Vineyard. Thank you. Thank you, Patrick. And I don't want to debate with you, but do you know the cost of a plastic um, fork versus the cost of a glass fork and the, con and the to go containers? Has any of that been done? And whether or not our local Board of Health <coughs> would support reuse of a to go container? And I can answer that question that, for you. Th hold on one second. These are the facts that don't exist right now. And, and this is what our restaurants are, are concerned about. Um, identify yourself for the record. Hi, my name is Mother Yvonne I, I would like to answer that question that you just asked. Good evening. Good evening, and thank you for giving me the opportunity. There are two things to take into consideration when we think about plastic cutlery. It is a cost center to restaurants, so actually banning their distribution by them would be a savings to them. So where they could substitute as easily, they could sell reusable cutlery in a napkin that perhaps even has their name embroidered on it for a couple of dollars, help change people's behaviors with regard to using reuse and having it with them. The challenge with the actual container is actually one that's being implemented slowly across different communities and actually other closed systems, such as Mount Holyoke College. Patrick brought up what's happening on Martha's Vineyard, and we actually have contacts over there, so we could actually discuss that with you. But ideally, don't you see how this could put the cape on the map at a time when we really do need some leadership on these issues? This article is not just being in, is being uh, brought up in Harwich, but it's being brought up in seven other Cape communities. If we were able to do this and create a closed loop system, not only would we do reduce disposal costs, but those millions of visitors that come to the Cape every year, they could take this with them. That plastic bottle ban, it is true. We don't have it as a completely Cape-wide effort. We have the municipal ban across all 15 towns, but we're working on it, sir. And if you give us a little time, we will have all 15 towns. Not everyone, obviously, will ever completely understand that we are a community, so their individual rights sometimes have to be let go or foregone for the better good. But we're hoping that we can re-engage -en people in that civic responsibility. Thank you. Thank you. Board ready to go to a motion? Yes. Go ahead, Don. I move that uh, we take this article and uh, accept and adopt it. Second. 
Okay, moved and seconded. All in favor? Aye. Opposed? Opposed. Three to one opposed. Prohibit fertilizer applica application. Patrick? I'm smiling because you didn't use the word ban. <laughs> Thank you. This is, a, this is not a simple uh, petition in that it's two parts. The first part is to ask the Board of Selectmen, to ask the state legislature to allow Harwich to have home rule on the use of fertilizers. Okay? And that could be a two-year process. All right? That's, that's, that's as much as I really need to say because that's what this involves. But what is it in essence? It's the fact that, again, we spend an hour and a half talking about our water quality issues and fertilizer is a contribution to our water quality. So we can take steps today to also address water quality issues, not at $50 million, not in 20 years time, but we can do it today at very low cost of simply not purchasing fertilizers. So what this will say, and if it does go to the state legislature, because it does pass town meeting, is that it will prohibit the application of fertilizer in the town of Harwich, except for the purposes of commercial agriculture and the residential use of, agri of organic fertilizers with low nitrogen and phosphorus for growing fruits and vegetables, okay? That's simple. Now you're going to ask me questions about enforcement, about education, uh, about banning, and those are all relevant, those are all true, okay? But this is the step in the process to educate. This is the step in the process to move forward at very low cost to begin as well addressing our water quality issues on Cape Cod. And that's basically the essence of, of what this petition is saying. Thank you, Patrick. Uh, we obviously took this up about a month and a half ago and voted unanimously not to support it at a Board of Selectmen's meeting. So moving forward, is there anything new information? Larry. No, that was going to be my point. I thought we had this discussion before, and, I, and I'm still uh, where I am there. I, I, I can't support this at this time. Uh, the, uh, not to repeat what I said before, but it's the... Uh, it's interesting that one of the point. well, first off, if you look at the fertilizer uh, addition to the water quality problem from what we just heard before, uh, I think the latest uh, information we have is maybe 10 to 12 percent of nitrogen comes from fertilizer. Approximately, yeah. And uh, when I look at ponds, uh, I note that uh, I don't spend much time in the garden stores, quite frankly. I'm not, I don't do a good job. <laughs> so you love me. I don't spend my <laughs> fertilizer. But a lot of times I was there, I didn't see any uh, lawn fertilizer, for instance, that had phosphorus in it. I think they've been uh, banned from fertilizer, so that's not a big source. And I was interested in the comment that uh, one of our uh, presenters made before of uh, the main, one of the main reasons that phosphorus gets to uh, ponds is uh, what he had referred to as sheeting. It's where you don't have any cover on the, on the uh, slope and you get, you get erosion because that's where a lot of phosphorus comes from. And so some fertilizer to help protect that sheeting would actually be beneficial. My other, uh, I think our, I will repeat part of our discussion before, I do like the educational aspect because I think the state now uh, requires uh, at least lawn fertilizers to be applied only be in, in the uh, summer months because when grass is growing, it takes up the fertilizer. And uh, they uh, ask you to mow your lawns and the time and the, uh, and the amount you apply. And we have never found a way to, to enforce that or educate people on that. And I know our uh, Board of Health and uh, Conservation is working, and Dan, our, our uh, wastewater, is working on a program to educate people on to get to meet your objective, or your, your, obje your objectives. And so I still want to go that way rather than, uh, than a ban. I think, we sh I think we can get there, but I, I, don't, uh, I think that's a better way of going. Thank you. Don? Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chair. Actually. Just to put this in perspective, this goes further than what we didn't support, um, because this not only goes to the state legislature, but it, it uh, prohibits the use and application. I'm speaking on the, on the basis of that guy who's got a grove of trees and a bunch of green stuff, 
that's not quite qualified to be called a lawn, uh, just so that my soil doesn't go somewhere. Uh, I, I voted with my feet. I think a lot of people can and should. Uh, it's up to them uh, to do that. But the jurisdiction isn't ours in any event. Uh, we passed that uh, window. The state legislature gave it to the Department of Agriculture in the state. And frankly, not only does it go too far, but I don't think that you are going to get any satisfaction out of the state legislature in this. It would, it would require legislative action. Both Sarah Peake and Julian Hang Sear. on one second, Pat. Oh, I'm sorry. All set? I am now. Yeah. Mary? Um, I, I agree with the comments made so far by my brothers, but two other pieces. In that discussion we had a month or six weeks ago, um, some of the people that were here were pretty eloquent about what the state requirements are. And to think that the town has that level of expertise to make decisions about fertilizer, um, we are not scientists, nor do we have a whole crowd of them over there. Larry's the a scientist. Larry's a scientist. <laughs> and the only other comment I'll make is our uh, legal counsel advised that, yes, a couple of towns have sought to do this, but it has not been approved by the general court, and he thinks that's unlikely. So I'm not interested in this for all the reasons we spent two hours on this a month ago. Okay, Patrick, I'm going to call on you, but I'm not going to get into the debate on who's right on what that's going to happen on town meeting floor. Yeah, that's, um, and that's fine. I am not going to support neither, it. Neither do I. <laughs> okay, I'm not going to support it either, so just okay. going in. All right. So both Nantucket and Orleans have passed in town meeting. The, again, this is a duplicate of what both Nantucket and Orleans passed. And it, it does differ from last November's discussion. You're, you're right. So... Um, yeah, uh, I guess I don't have anything else to say. <laughs> so <laughs> I hear your opinion, and that's good. So, but uh, we'll see what happens. Thank you, Pat. All right, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I can feel my age now. I used to have to sit through meetings like this when I was a younger man. Thank God I don't have to do it anymore. Um, Mr. Anderson and um, Don Howell were 100% correct. The town had an opportunity back when Paula Champagne was the um, health director, we had extensive public meetings and hearings on it before the then Board of Health decided that, as Mary said, we do not have the expertise and the scientists on board to stand behind the facts that are being presented to us. It's better in the state. At that time, I sat through seven months, five, six hours, twice a week, with a room full of scientists and heard all about how everything migrates through our soils and eventually gets to our drinking water. And that's what the state used when they came forward with their regulations banning the use of fertilizers from October 1st to the 1st of March because you cannot put fertilizer on frozen ground. Basically when it rains out, it runs off and gets into our estuaries and that was supported 100% by all the people in the industry. Also, out in the hallway, I had a brief discussion with the petitioner, and he mentioned a uh, survey done that there was, I believe, over 6 million pounds of fertilizer being used on Cape Cod. That number was thrown at that meeting that I was at almost 11 years ago now, and the gentleman from Scots was there, and he said, if that's true, I'm going to go home and lose my job because Scots figured about 300,000 pounds were being used, not six to seven million. So the numbers that they use in the calculator are extremely off limits. They're just not right. This is a ban, basically, because once you ask the state for the ability to move out of their regulations, it's going to be a burden on the Board of Health to put local town uh, restrictions on it. And I'm telling you right now, we don't have the science and the people on board to do it correctly. Other thing I want to mention, I'm an organic farmer. I've been an organic, certified organic farmer for 21 years. There is no fertilizer sold in the Commonwealth of Massachusetts that contains phosphate, except starter fertilizer for lawns and organic fertilizer. So if you apply organic fertilizer wrong and not by the label, 
you actually will be far more detrimental to the environment than you will if you were using regular fertilizer because that has phosphate in it and as I learned in those meetings phosphate is one of those chemicals that travels through the soil attaches to other particles and moves right down into our waterways that's why we banned it so just by using the term organic because it makes you feel good it's not in fact a real good practice following the label is the practice and that's what we don't do many many times so maybe the Board of Health should look at making a flyer that they're going to ask all the people in town that sell fertilizer. Cut you off right there. We're right already on. working on that, and this is a great debate for town meeting. And all they've got to say is follow the label. Yes. Thank you. Agreed. Thank you. <coughs> May I make one more comment, or are we out of time? Brief. So there's no science involved in this because it clearly states prohibiting the application of fertilizers except for agricultural and or home use. There's no one... It doesn't take a science to understand that phrase, okay? Um, the, the organic sort of fertilizer must be OMRI, which is the Organic Materials Review Institute. They qualify which fertilizers can and cannot be used, okay? I think we're ready for a vote. Yeah. Thank, Thank you, you, Patrick. Any motion? Yeah. Just one quick comment. <clears throat> the way I read this... Uh, if we want to grow fruits and vegetables on our front lawn, then it, that would allow it. But it does, in fact, prohibit uh, lawn uh, applications. It does. Okay. Well, I just want to get that out there. Uh, I move that we accept and adopt this uh, article. Second. Okay. Moved and second. Any further discussion? All in favor? Opposed? Opposed. Opposed. Four zero opposed. All right. Next up, Townway Old Brewster Road. Anyone here for Townway, Old Brewster Road? Hello, good evening, everyone. Good evening. Thank you. Um, attorney Robert Scarano, who is our attorney, had sent over the memorandum to support um, to all of you last week um, to support it um, as it would be no cost to the town or the taxpayers just to create the easement um, and everything would be, uh, the utilities would fall on the easement and not on Old Brewster Road, so hence um, any repairs or anything in the future would not be um, any re anything replaced. The town would not be responsible Great. for. Thank you. Thank you. Um, there is a legal opinion that we got from council on all of these articles. Council came back and, and suggested that this get indefinitely postponed because the process for for this has not been followed, which would start with the planning board. I will get you that's on town meeting floor regardless, and, okay. and you will say that. But so you have it, I will get that to you okay. through staff tomorrow. Mary, do you want to give a, is there a brief explanation, or is it a very wordy lawyer uh, explanation? It's kind of a wordy. <clears throat> I recommend that this article be passed over or indefinitely postponed for the reason that it does not appear the steps required to be taken by the town in advance of town meeting have been accomplished, and it does not appear there's sufficient time. Really goes yeah, down to a requires, planning board process. It requires a public having, no, no. He doesn't give any more particulars. Yeah. So l let me get it. We'll hear it on town meeting floor. Um, okay. But I'll have the legal opinion tomorrow to you. Thank you very much. Go ahead. Yep. <laughs> In that spirit, I, I move that we accept and adopt this article for a town meeting. Second. Moved and second. Any further discussion? All in favor? Opposed? Opposed. 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 Four zero. All right. School choice. Mr. Baker. <coughs> I stated your name, but state it for the record, please. Okay. Dan Baker, a resident of Howarch. Uh, I'm here tonight uh, to present uh, the school choice article uh, again this year. I thought it went rather well at town meeting uh, last year, and I th thought the voice vote was rather close. And I'm hopeful to get your blessing on the article tonight. Uh, I'd like to also thank all the people that took time out of their busy lives to be here tonight. Thank you. Uh, the article basically asked the town to ask the selectmen to petition the state to extend school choice funding to other 
forms of state-allowed alternative education, not just charter schools. Massachusetts already has a, uh, has already confirmed that public funding of school choice is important because we already have a publicly funded uh, school choice program. They just fell short by only including charter schools while excluding other forms of state allowed alternative education. Uh, this, this idea is for helping individual students statewide to be able to thrive in an education that works for them instead of being stuck in a system that does not work for them. And uh, extending school choice is, is not an abstract idea. In fact, uh, a recent article, Forbes article, uh, was titled uh, that there is undeniable mo momentum in sc with school choice. And uh, last year, after the town meeting, I, I learned that, um, that the third week in January is actually called National School Choice Week and it was put in place by presidential proclamation and it's been uh, approved by governors and mayors across the country. And this includes homeschooling and private schooling. Uh, there's also a National School Choice Week website. It's at uh, schoolchoiceweek.com and it lists all the states with all the myriad of, uh, of expansive school choice programs and I encourage everybody to check it out and become informed, that's schoolchoiceweek.com. Uh, and I think we can all agree that the long-term goal for education is that the student, is that when the student wins, the community wins. And this is the win-win we're investing in. Uh, so I'm hopeful that uh, you can see the possibilities that if this is done correctly, this idea will level the, level the field for all economic uh, situations and it can truly facilitate education equity for all. So, uh, well, th this topic's much bigger than just me. I'm he merely here to be the messenger, and I'm hoping for a favorable vote on this article. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Mary, I'll start with you. Okay. Um, I do remember the discussion last year, and I remain opposed to this. I think public funds are for public education and school choice is to move within the public school system. And I don't think, I think it's a separation of church and state in some cases, so I am not in favor. Thank you, Don. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. I mean, I'm ardently in favor of school choice and uh, charter schools. I'm just not sure where that line gets drawn eventually. I, if I were in that circumstance and I had a child that wasn't uh, responding well to either uh, the any of the alternatives, I certainly wouldn't hesitate to uh, homeschool my kid because that, that my primary focus is what's best for them, not what's best for the school system. But having said that, uh, uh, there comes a point where Mary's probably right. I mean, the uh, it, it's a socialization process too when you go to school. And to the extent that you start pulling people out of the school system, not only does that not occur, but you can't amortize the overhead cost of even operating a school at a certain point if everybody goes off in a different direction and takes their money with them. Uh, so while I thoroughly encourage people uh, to seek out alternatives, I, I can't support another level of kids leaving the school systems. And I did that in plural because there are the charter schools and there is school choice so people are already moving around Larry. Uh, thank you for your uh, presentation I uh, uh, you know this is an interesting discussion because I I think Malmoy is such an excellent school system on the other hand I presume there are those few students I think it's probably a small number that may feel they're getting better education at home and uh, I think uh, I'm for giving options that best fit each, each student. I did get a uh, good letter today making some of the points that Don made that may, that may be okay, but we're pulling money away from the public school. I'm not sure what percent of how, if that's a significant factor, but I support this because I do think that they should have options. We can go, when I moved here, we were just starting into uh, school choice, into the uh, public schools, and people argued against that. And uh, I think my discussions with the uh, former uh, superintendent, uh, Carolyn Cragen, actually we got into that a bit because 
we lost money, we continue, I think we don't anymore, but we lose money for years, but on the other hand, there was significant evidence that uh, competition was good. Uh, Harvard uh, improved uh, significantly was, uh, when they had competition from you know, losing students. So there was some benefit out of that as well. So I support it. I don't know if we'll get to town meeting again, but I think, it, again, I do, for those true in individuals that have difficulty, I'd like to give opportunities, uh, some options there. I'm going with Larry on this one. The, um, the, art, the, the article, um, I think you, you've addressed some of the <coughs> concerns that you're saying any changes to the MGL should consider interim su support to address any negative draw down impacts to public schools, and I think that's a great statement that wasn't there last year. Um, you know, we were presented tonight with a uh, $44,382,000 budget from our public school system with a mere $1.580 million increase over last year, 4.3. And to Don's point on, on socialization, um, public school systems aren't necessarily great socialization for some and they really should have an option, and, and the parents that are homeschooling their kids should be proud of homeschooling their kids and are giving them a great education, and it's up to the parents to socialize their kids. Um, so I think you nailed it with the article this year. Um, I think we've got a long way to go with the um, public school system. But more importantly, I, I think last year we had so much money in the state, they sent us money back. Wow. Um, and now we have a billionaire's tax that they're talking about adding an awful lot of money to that fund again. So why not, as a board, ask the state to consider, consider giving some money to the families that need it? Because I also received several letters today, and some of them were opposed to it because they don't need the money. But that's not across the board. Absolutely that's not, not covering people's expenses so that they can't go to work a full-time job. So I absolutely support this, and I think it's the right thing to do. I will open it up to anyone in the public that wishes to speak, and I would say the same disclaimer I said before, maybe you came in the room. If somebody before you says it, you don't necessarily have to repeat it. Just say I agree with it. <coughs> it's 840. We still have a fair, fair agenda. I don't want to cut you off, so you're welcome to speak. Um, and so far you have support of two of us anyway, and this will be a long debate again yes. on town meeting floor, I'm sure, but it's... It's short-sighted to me for some of the public involved in the school system to worry more about money being taken away from the public school um, to educate kids than, than uh, consider those kids that need to be homeschooled. Absolutely. Um, just real quick, um, you know, uh, this article was uh, not intended to solve all the questions or, or, or have all the answers for what a perfect expanded school choice program should look like. All it suggests is that there is enough evidence out there. There's a lot going on in this country on school choice it, it, that shows that there is something very good here that needs to be looked at. Now, you're looking at the draconian, you know, uh, program where uh, everybody leaves the school system and, uh, and they're eviscerated. Uh, that's, <coughs> not, that's not what I'm talking about here. I mean, the, the, uh, the state can benchmark best practices around the country as far as drawdown impacts on the school. Schools that are not functioning, uh, I'm sorry, but you gotta give these kids a way out, you know? And, and, and the other thing is, uh, the schools that are functioning well, like Larry said, you might get a couple of kids leaving, you know, because the school does function well. So I, I think it's the ultimate no child left behind program, okay? And so I, I hope you'll vote for it. <coughs> Thank you. Oh. I'm going to do my best to try to get them that one more vote. <laughs> um, I'm a taxpayer in this town. I'm a taxpayer towards the school choice funding. I have no child in the school. This does not affect me personally at all. I do, however, take issue with the statement that some people might think someone is actually going to homeschool their child now just because they're going to get $2,500 a, a year from the state. I will tell you that's a ludicrous <laughs> statement. Okay, anyone that wants to homeschool their child is going to do it, and they're going to do it anyhow. This seeks to have the legislature have the discussion and come up with a reasonable amount of money that they can get to help them buy supplies and buy materials. But since you were able to use the example that a lot of people are going to rush now and leave our schools, 
I can equally come back with a statement and say I sat here through the presentation of the school budget and our school uh, a superintendent said that 20 percent of the kids in the school have learning disabilities and he actually I believe is asking for two more employees to help him cover that situation so I would tell you that you know what maybe those kids that have the socialization problem or learning disabilities might be homeschooled and now they're going to get twenty five hundred three thousand five thousand dollars from homeschool funds as opposed to you people having to hire somebody at two hundred thousand dollars a year to teach them so see good things can come out of this too support it because it needs to be debated at the state house and the town of Howard should be one of the leading towns saying state look at this thank you anyone else hi my name is April Croker and I'm a homeschool parent I'm also a homeschool advocate and I'm here representing the Wholesome Truth Project, Massachusetts um, Barnstable No Mandates, and Moffa Cape Cod. These are organizations that support parents' rights and parents' rights to educate their children the way that they want to. Um, I can tell you right now that there is a large number of families in Massachusetts in particular who have children that are homeschooling and the reason that they choose to homeschool is because their children have special needs and they need to have a specialized environment for their children that works for them if you know anything about having a special needs chi child then you might know that it's very expensive and so I think that we should be you know in a time where everyone is worried about um, inclusivity and equity we should really think about that and how much we want to be a part of that and think about these families who really need this money and are trying to do what's best for their family so there's really no reason for us to not support them and to block them from having that opportunity also statistics show that homeschool children do significantly better um, education wise than um, children that are in the public school system. So that, that's con been consistently shown in many different studies. Not only that, but homeschool children are less likely to have early pregnancy, to be involved in drug use, to have um, uh, identity crisis, and uh, to, commit, to commit crimes. So they're less likely to be sucking resources out of the community than children who are in the public school systems. No offense to those children. This is just the statistics. Um, and they actually roll over through the entire United States. I'm a homeschool advocate. I talk to parents um, about homeschooling and help them unenroll their children from the system. And parents want what's best for their children, and they know what's best for their children. The least that we could do is recognize that and offer them something to just help them with that. And, and they do need that help. So that's all I really have to say. But the other thing I wanted to point out is that um, people um, that I've talked to on boards like this before uh, sometimes are under the impression that homeschool families are wealthy and that they don't need these extra handouts or helps or whatever you want to call them. And that's not true. Um, actually, the majority of people who do homeschool in the United States are people that are in the lower income rates. So please keep that in mind. Thank you. Thank you. My name is Rick Brigham. I'm happy to be here. My father taught in the Harwich School System. His name was Robert Brigham. Some of you, he was a driver ed teacher. But you know, he had to work a second job in order for us to have what we needed. And I'm thinking, socializing in public schools, I personally would have done much better without the socializing of public schools. <laughs> Bullies, manipulation, intimidation. Public schools are not a great place to be socialized. And I would much prefer to have been home with my father, who is a history buff and probably would have done a great job. He often quizzed me for the test. 
I would much rather have been home. And had he been, had my family been supported in the way that's being proposed, perhaps he wouldn't have had to have a second job in order to be able to be home to take care of my education. I also want to say equity, a lot about equity these days. This is an inequitable system that if there are people who have the means to put their student where they want them, they can do that. If they don't have the means, they can't. It's not equitable. I also think public funds, we are the public. The public funds should go where it's needed within the public. And I'll, complete, uh, I'll conclude with a metaphor. <clears throat> if there were two restaurants in our town and parents had the choice to bring their children to one or two of the restaurants and they found one of the restaurants wasn't quite suiting the needs of the child. Maybe they were allergic to certain foods. There was some reason that, um, that the, the, the restaurant wasn't quite right for them. And there was another restaurant that was right for them, met all of their needs, but because the town is subsidizing the restaurant that does not meet the child's needs, the parent loses the choice and has to keep taking the child to the parent to the restaurant that isn't good for the child. So it's it's actually prejudicial and limits the parent's ability to choose what's best for their children. So I would encourage a yes vote for this. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Can we get a motion? Yes. I move that we accept and adopt this article for inclusion in town meeting. Second. second. Okay. Moved and second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. A couple of those speakers were very eloquent. The young lady and the last gentleman. I hate to disappoint. Hate to disappoint Leo, but uh, Michael had me before he even spoke. Four in favor. <laughs> just so you all know, everybody. <laughs> okay, speaking of Leo. You can let him think <laughs> otherwise, though. Did he leave? Yeah. Huh? Uh, his feelings? On the hall, uh, having a side discussion. All right, we'll give uh, give a second <laughs> for them awesome. for them to clear. <laughs> <laughs> See, he's taking care of this. You can tell him later what really happened. <laughs> Good evening. Good evening. Or state your name. For I the take issue, Mr. Chairman, with the fact that that last petitioner, the statement has been on record that this year's article was better written. Cindy, thank you. Can you? you wrote last year's I wrote article. last year's article, and all he added to it was the fact that this is going to now not be whatever. So we don't hold that against yeah. you. All right, I don't know, gang. I'm just here to tell you guys um, uh, whatever you want to do. You guys know the issue. Uh, I have two articles that I submitted by petition. They are in reference to the use of the 374 Main Street property and for the town to enter into a municipal agreement with a school uh, to turn it into an agricultural education center. And as long as we are all working towards that, I will do anything that in my power to make that easier for you guys. If you want me to withdraw these petitions or agree to have them indefinitely postponed, I will be more than happy to do it. I understand that one of them, if you don't mind, Mr. Chairman, I believe the two of them are mine, the next two, so yes. we can take them together for discussion purposes. But the one that talks about um, amending the article back in 2001, I believe it was, or 2000, I understand may not be a uh, legally a thing that can be done on town meeting floor. However, I would suggest to the Board of Selectmen, why not? Because if you get this town meeting to say, you know what, it's a good idea to add the word education to the agricultural use, it just shows you that you have the support to do it. But if you guys decide, and your uh, young lady, decide in your infant wisdom that you don't want to do it, I'd be more than happy to withdraw it. The only other thing I'd like to at this time draw to your attention is back in 2001, on October 25th, Ron Sander, who was the assistant town administrator at the time and was the chairman of the review board that reviewed the applications to lease this property back in 2001, came to the then Board of Selectmen with this document, which was his suggestion on giving, awarding the lease to Cape Farm Supply, who is me. The very first thing, and he lists, he uh, doesn't have them numbered here, I'm going to list about ten reasons why I'm a better selection over the others. I want to <coughs> just take it this time and read you just the first one, though. Remember, this is October 25th, 
2021. 2001. 2001. Uh, awarded to Cape Farm Supply, the Main Street proposal, because of an agricultural education center educating the public about farming and its practices. So even back as far as day one, when this property was leased to me, I'd been wanting to turn it into an agricultural education center. Here we are 21 years later. So let's do it. And Mr. Chairman, through you to the board, if there's any other things I can add tonight, I'd be more than happy to. If not, let me know how we're doing. Thank you. And just for the board, we have one that the town council said wasn't proper, one that um, the first one that we're talking about now uh, is proper. Uh, we discussed having our own article to get to the same place on this. Town council thought it was better to have, to leave the petitioner's article in there. Town council is currently working on the deeds to that property and what portion was uh, purchased with which money. And it's not looking like we're going to need this vote at all. But this is a good uh, backup just in case we do. Larry, any comments, questions? Thank you for that, Michael. Uh, real, we've talked about this some time. I, I guess my question is going to be, why the devil is it taking so long? Let me correct that for the record. <laughs> it's got an awful lot to do with the attorneys involved, including one of the attorneys for the and, place that wants to uh, put and, the agricultural and, and, well, center Well, I'm being facetious somewhat, Michael, because that's taken a long time. Because and it was a unanimous vote of this board to support said article we, or project. I very much I just want to support it. I want it to move ahead. So whatever Thank we can do. The only thing ahead. I will say in response to the chairman's comments is that I wrote a draft memorandum of understanding, a uh, municipal agreement between the town and the school. It was three pages long. It was given to the attorneys, and it came back with 86 pages. <laughs> and it had nothing in it more than what I covered in three. So to answer your question, Mr. Ballantyne, and I think the chairman has it right, yeah. we're getting bogged down in legal Ease. whatever. Ease. This is well, the right uh, thing to do. And I do also want to say, Mr. Chairman, if I can, I have since, uh, this is now because it's been filed and it is public record and people have seen it, uh, it has been on out there in the media, and I have had probably a half a dozen, if not a dozen, businesses that want to get involved in this because they're looking to educate people uh, that they hire for not only fertilizer application and things like that, but even um, hydraulic licensing, which will be part of this also, this educational process, learning how to run a machine and getting the proper licenses for it. So, and that's not counting the colleges and the institutions that I told you in the past that are still waiting and chomping at the bit to get going. Thank my, you. My only end comment is, uh, I appreciate my comment that it may not be needed. I'm for putting actually both of them on, if, if possible, just to be sure that we, don't leave, we leave nothing un, untouched. And, and Both are forward. on anyway. Yes. So whether we support it or not, that's a, that, that's about to be determined. Don, yeah. uh, comment or a motion? Um, comment. <laughs> One wonders whether our legal counsel gets paid by their page. Uh, having said that, you only gave part of the story. I just want to make sure everybody gets uh, because I was on that board that actually selected uh, your bid, and there was a real good reason for it uh, because there was substantial discussion at the town meeting that authorized this, that you could get two bangs for the buck, that you could get conservation uh, uh, property out of this, and you would have a working legacy bog, uh, and it was presumed that that would be a demonstration project. So, uh, the other bid didn't fulfill that, which is why we did uh, make the award in the direction we did. I, I think it's disappointing at a, at a minimum that legal counsel doesn't take uh, into account the legislative history of the discussion about what we thought we were agreeing to, because town meeting clearly agreed to what we're putting uh, in here now, but it didn't wind up being uh, part of the language of the Warren article, so he's ignoring that. But with that, I'd be willing to make a motion that we uh, accept and adopt and include this on the town warrant. Second. Okay, moved and second. The only clarification is there's two legal counsels mm -hmm. working on us, not just one, and our counsel KP Law has gone um, the extra distance and done a lot of work on this to try and just have it done without going through this process. Any further discussion? 
Which article are we moving here? Do we first one. Okay. First okay. Yep. Further discussion? No. All in favor? Aye. Opposed? Uh, if the board so changes their mind as we get closer to town meeting, even the night of town meeting, and you do want to withdraw or change your support for the second article, I have no problem with it. I, do th I don't see any bad coming out of it, though. But I would not get up at town meeting and override your decision. If you want it pulled even at that time, I'd be more than happy to get up and agree that it be indefinitely postponed if things change between now and then. Thank you. Don? I'd like to see them both with your support, because I don't think any hurt's going to come out of the second one either. Always leave them wanting more. Mr. Chair, I <laughs> move that we uh, accept and adopt the second article for inclusion of warrant. Second. No. No discussion? No discussion. All in favor? Aye. 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 Four zero. All right. Moving on. Um, I'm going to move back to discussion on fiscal year 2024 department operating budget. As mentioned, that was a placeholder, and two months ago I said I'd put it on every agenda, so here it is. Any questions on the budget? Larry? No, no I was just with Don? Nope. No. Mary? Nope. Anyone in the public? All right, we're moving on from that one again. <laughs> Uh, okay, now we're on to vote to place additional articles. Let me just get to that spot. Uh, we're going to vote some of them to put in the warrant, some of them to put in the warrant and accept and adopt. And stand by because send the packet. So where is the packet? Uh, the first one is Article 5, the school. That one we have not voted to support yet. What page uh, in our packet is 13. In our packet. Oh, in the packet. I don't know. I printed it. All right. Give me one second, Don. I'll, uh, I'll find it. All right. Agenda packet. And we are oh, on to the warrant. That's going to be You're talking about right, the Article 5. The school is going to be on page... 13. So if you want, Don, I'll do what I did last time. Look at the bottom of your, your counter for what it is in the... Uh, on, the on the page, 110. Uh, by, uh, one, there's 110 one ten on yeah. the okay, uh, that's website, I, mean. I think. So I would uh, look for a motion to accept and adopt Monomoy Regional School District budget. So moved. Second. Okay, and we should put a number in there. Uh, 28, 469, 466. Estimated cost of. That's part of the motion? Yes. Part of the second? Yep. Any discussion? Nope. All in favor? Aye. 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 Four zero. Now that puts it on. The, excuse me, Michael. Do you also want to uh, vote support? That was to support because we had already placed. placed. Okay. We had already placed it. So now we're going to go to Article Eleven, which is lease purchase agreements. This would be a motion to put on the warrant and to accept and adopt. Uh, do you want to split them up, or do you want to put them? I combo. think we can, to, in okay. a matter of time, I don't see any debate on this one. We should okay. probably just do it. So, Chair, I move that we place on the warrant and accept and adopt the leach purchase agreement uh, article. Second. Moved and seconded. Any discussion? No. All in favor? Aye. 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 Four zero. Article 14 would be the next opiate settlement, and this would be place and accept and adopt. We did 12 already. Uh, family support program? Or? Did What's that? The preschool family support program we, we did. We, okay. Yep. 14 we already did. Yep. It's got our votes. Yeah, I thought we did. Article 14? Yep. Mm. We all voted yes. See, Mary? You said you were going to keep track yep. of me. Yep, I'm keeping track of you. Okay, Article 15, uh, capital plan. This would be a motion to put on the warrant and then a motion to accept and adopt if we want to split it. Can I get a motion on that from someone besides Don? He's hesitating. Yeah, I'll, I'll, I moved to, I'll moved to place it on the warrant. Let's okay. do it separately. Second. Okay, moved and seconded to place Article 15, adopt the capital plan on the warrant. Any discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? You are an aye, right? I'm an aye. Okay. 4-0 to put it on the warrant. Now I need a motion to accept and adopt Article 15. I move to accept and adopt the capital plan. Article 15. Second. Which is Article 15 for the public. Any discussion? Don? I've beaten this to death, so no. Okay. Um, all in favor? Aye. 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 Four, three, one. Next one I have, Mary, is Article 25. I have And that's got to come back to us because they have not voted any change yet. 
So that will be a next week uh, vote after their meeting. Okay. We can't close the warrant tonight anyway, so we will be discussing it next week. Okay. Uh, Article 36 is the next one I have, Mary. I have 37. All right, let's get there and see who's wrong. <laughs> I thought we did the water. Article 36, amend, amend general bylaws, chapter 300, water. We yep. I don't believe we voted to we support did. it, did we? Yep, we got our roll call, Okay. Four zero. And that's okay. to place and support? Uh, that was to support, so we must okay. have placed it. All right. Article 37 is the next one that I have. This is the mm -hmm. ADUs. Yeah, and then we can go. This is still, um, this is going back to public hearing. This was uh, continued to the 28th. I did post that as a joint meeting so all board members can speak if they want. Um, I see no reason why we wouldn't vote to put this on the warrant tonight. It could be IP'd if it doesn't get approved, but this is something we've all talked about uh, at nauseum and, and supported, so I would accept a motion to put this on the warrant. I'm so moved. Second. Okay, moved and seconded to put Article 37, Amend Zoning Bylaw, Chapter 325, Article 5, Use Regulations relating to um, accessory dwellings on the warrant. Any discussion? No. no. All in favor? Aye. 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 Four zero. Do we want to vote to support it? Yes. Uh, yes. Can we get a motion on that? I move that we vote to adopt and support amend zoning bylaw, chapter 325, mm -hmm. article five use regulations, article 37. Okay. Second. Moved and seconded. Any discussion? Don? Yeah, I don't want anybody reading into this because I think uh, it, we've talked about this. In, in general, I support this. I just feel like zoning bylaws really should come up organically. This is kind of like uh, the changes. We're on editorial change four uh, over six weeks that I would prefer to you know, do zoning with, with a more measured look to it. So it's not about me being unalterably opposed to this but I'm not going to vote to support it because of where we are and what time it is. Okay. Any further discussion? Well, let me, uh, uh, Don, to your point, we'll vote this, but to, we're having a joint meeting with the planning board. I assume there might be some minor changes coming out from, from that meeting, which would make it, by definition, a more organic approach with planning uh, board involvement. Yeah, I, I don't want to beat this to death, but when, when I was on the planning board, and it was about four or five years, uh, we'd have discussions with stuff that would start in August. Uh, we'd move our way so that everybody knew what was going on. I'm just objecting to because I think there's some loose ends still in the timing. I, I, don't want to, I don't want to come back a third time to town meeting to have them say, well, the first two we didn't really mean. We've got to change it again. So you're just suggest oh. Go ahead, Mary. You're, you're just suggesting that we wait until planning is done and then take our vote. I'm okay with that. Yeah. Is that your suggestion, Don? It, I think it, it's it is. I mean, that. it's a little bit more than that, but I would prefer that that happen because this is really backwards. If we if we approve something that hasn't even been finalized and approved and That's sent forward to we us. Yeah, we got a few that so have to come back. We're going to anyway. withdraw your second. We yes. made a motion on this, right? Yeah. You're going to withdraw your motion. Yes. Okay. This is coming back. My only point to this is we're actually getting close to what the commission, Cape Cod Commission, uh, put in originally with suggestions to the town. We tweaked ours going into town meeting when we approved it. We've taken East Harwich out of this, the water, the DCPC. It's completely out of this. And for the public, if we could get five more units of workforce housing out of a change this year, then it's a good change. And this is specifically being done to address complaints and problems that people are having based on lot square footage and minor changes. So I, I think it'd be to wait another year to build any housing it is a travesty in this, in, in my opinion. So we'll see it. We'll bring this back next week. And Larry, it's not really a joint meeting. I posted it because they can Julie okay. wanted to go, okay. Mary wanted to go, and I plan on going, and well, Don was at the last one. And I certainly agree with your point. I think we'll certainly uh, vote to... Uh, uh, support. support it next week. Yes. So I don't think we'll, we'll, we'll uh, back away from that. Okay, Don. But in so saying, because this is one a discussion that I had with you, Mary, back in January, I really want to, to commit to exploring uh, compliance and how we deal with that because Dennis has got some uh, 
regulations about uh, annually renewing approvals and inspections. I, I don't want to just let this be just uh, like a regular house. It gets inspected and for the next 50 years, nobody walks into it to inspect anything. Okay, next one uh, is Article 38, Amend Zoning Bylaw, Chapter 325, Article 17, Floodplain Regulations. We need to put in the warrant and accept and adopt. I move to, Mr. Chair, uh, to uh, place uh, the Chapter 325 article on the town meeting warrant and to accept and adopt. Second. Okay, moved and second. Any discussion? No. All in favor? Aye. Aye, Aye four zero. <coughs> article 40 which is another uh, zoning related to solar marriage topic. Amend zoning bylaw chapter 325, article 22, large uh, scale. Go ahead. 40? That would 30, be article 39, sorry. Okay. My yeah. numbers are off. Um, can I get a motion on that one? And that's to place in the warrant and accept and adopt. I'll let Mary do it because it was uh, she, her brought forward. Okay, I move that we place it on the warrant and accept and adopt Second. as spoken. Okay, and that's uh, place on the warrant and accept and adopt Article 39, Amend Zoning Bylaw, Chapter 325, Article 22, Large Scale Ground Mounted Photovoltaic Arrays. Any discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 Four zero. And Article 42. You skipped 40, the school agreement. You're skipping that intentionally. Did we not? Um, I don't know that we moved to accept and adopt. I know what we placed. Hang on. All right, let's just get a motion on it to cover ourselves. I, I move that we accept and adopt Article 40 uh, re relative to the agreement between the towns of Chatham and Harwich. Second. Moved and second. Any discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 Four zero. Now, I'm on, am I on my other one? 42. Take a motion on that, and that is uh, acquisition of an easement at 129 Route 28 for Route 28 water main project. Is this both place and? I would take both place and support. Okay. Uh, Mr. Chair, I move that we place Article 42 on the town meeting warrant and then vote to accept and adopt it. Second. And that's got an estimated cost of $10,000. Yep. Any discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 Linda, I see you reading. If I skip over, you yell at me, all right? I'll, I'll, I'll read <laughs> Article, 43. what are we at? We're at 43. 43. This, is re this one relates to, so it's authorized selectmen to convey parcel of land at 276 Queen Anne Road, and that is formerly known as the Pet Cemetery, but this is the final piece. Please to us um, uh, being able to sell this parcel of land. Both place and accept and adopt? Both place and accept and Mr. adopt. Mr. Chair, I move that we uh, place Article 43, uh, authorize the selectmen to convey parcel of land at 276 Twin Anne Road, and that we vote to accept and adopt. Second. Okay, moved and seconded. Any discussion? Just Go ahead. This is really important. We don't have much of a uh, uh, industrial zone in this town. And it's shrunk from when I've moved in the town over the last 32 years. So um, we did put Stonewood products, uh, which enabled them to more than double in size. They, em uh, size. they employ people. They pay uh, property taxes. I think this is terrific if we can start getting performance out of that property for what its intended purpose is. And this would give us the tools to go out with an RFP to get yep. proposals to purchase for someone to purchase. Well, and the key uh, is the, the statement that's commercial zone for commercial activity because people will ask when it's come up before they've gotten confused between commercial and residential. Uh, any further discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 Four zero. Article forty four. Acquisition of Forest Street property. This would be placed on the warrant and accept and adopt. Uh, we were approached a long while back from someone that wants to gift us these pieces of land, uh, and we need this mechanism to be able to take them as a gift. Mr. Chair, I move that we uh, place on the warrant Article 44, Acquisition of Forest Street Property, and that we accept and adopt it at an estimated cost of $5,000. Second. Moved and second. Any discussion? No. All in favor? Aye. 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 Four zero. Article 45, authorization payment lieu of taxes, pilot agreements. 
this is a new one as well, and this was a uh, the park and ride in, in, um, on 124, which we do not own. Um, someone has um, gotten permission to put solar panels above the electric chargers, and we need to do this to get tax money or payment in lieu of taxes. So customary article, that not customary, but we need this to be able to make this deal. I'm in for making more money. Yeah. Uh, Mr. Chair, I move that we uh, place on the uh, town meeting uh, warrant, uh, authorization payment in lieu of taxes, pilot agreements, Article 45, and that we accept and adopt it. Second. Moved and second. Any discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 Four zero. Article 47. Supplemental funding for Brooks Academy renovations in the amount estimated amount of four hundred and seventy five thousand dollars. We already placed this though, didn't we? I don't believe we did. Okay. Um, I would I would say that we should do both because I don't recall uh, placing it. Okay. Before we go to a motion. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair. Um, Linda Sabula, Treasurer, and Anita Doucette here, who is our president of the Harwich Historical Society. We're hoping that you support this. Uh, we were there today with uh, looking over the building because we're now midway through construction, and we wanted to take a look at the walls. We did get permission from the contractor, so we didn't just sneak in. Uh, Shocking. <laughs> <laughs> we have, there are a variety of cracks in the building, existing buildings, you know, a couple hundred years old, a lot of cracks, but we did notice many more, some of which are about to fall off the walls if someone sneezes. So we have taken pictures, which we are happy to share with you. We'll be sharing them with Sean Libby and with the contractor, et cetera, and David Spitz was there. We have some public safety issues because if the, we have ceiling tiles that are buckling to the extent that they're gonna fall down, uh, if we have walls that are so badly damaged through this process that they're also going to fall down, there are safety issues here. There's some new water leaks. There are some places where the wall has separated from the ceiling. So we're hoping that while we do understand the rationale for taking the $600,000 out of the capital plan, we understand the rationale, we hope that you will support this article provide the funding to, prov to continue the project, finish it to completion, the foundation part, and do any necessary repairs to the walls for public safety issues. And we really appreciate that. Thank you. You had me at hello. Huh? You had me at hello. Oh, Michael, <laughs> I, you're uh, sweet. Can I get a public, can I get a, a motion? And this accomplishes that, motion? right? <laughs> and, then, and then we can comment. All right. Mr. Chair, I move that we uh, place on the warrant Article 47, supplemental funding for Brooks Academy renovations, and that we accept and adopt in the estimated amount of $475,000. Okay, moved and seconded. Uh, comments, Larry? Uh, none. We've gone this far. We should complete it. Don? I would have loved to have seen how they got from the road to the building. <laughs> um, that's part of the funding is that concrete step, I think. I, it must be an on-ramp that Mary? I'm unaware of. The only comment... The only comment I'll make is that I don't know that this 475 Enough. was designed to take care of what Linda described. My understanding is that was some concealed uh, conditions. The concealed conditions that were referred to are the, uh, primarily the sill rot, yeah. as well as there are two places in the walls in the basement, the, ex the basement, that don't have any foundation under them. They're sitting directly on sand. So there's uh, uh, some of the repairs or additional work that has to be done is to do some hoo-ha so that those walls are not just sitting on sand, which means they'll continue to sink. Because if you are in our building and put the egg on the floor, so that's the hidden conditions. Uh, these are the wall issues, are conditions that arise from the lifting of the building, the shaking it around, the machinery, et cetera. I understand that. I'm just not positive this 475 was intended to cover the things you and Anita just observed, or if it's just for those concealed conditions, including 
There was uh, cement stairs under wooden stairs. We, we Those are ramp. Bunch of we had a conversation with the town administrator, yeah. and this is a fairly broad description of what the money can be used for. The things that you were talking about total two hundred and seventy thousand, okay. maybe okay. ish. So there's a fair there's amount left, room. and there's okay. also a CPC article in place for over six hundred thousand um, that they're going to get. So okay. hopefully, between the two, we'll have enough to get us in good shape. Finish it. Yeah. Um, and then just, uh, oh, go ahead, Don. Yeah, I just want uh, to convey to Linda that I hope you come to town meeting uh, prepared to explain what hoo-ha is. <laughs> okay. Uh, and I would just say that the, the, the sale of land sinking funds was new to me. Yeah. But it, but it really is a, it's a great effort by this board to remove uh, vacant properties that we had no debt on. So by selling Five Ooh. Bells Neck and selling the Bank Street Fire Department, both vacant buildings, we have the money to put into one of our historic buildings. And, and personally, I commend you all for looking for ways to create funding for some of these properties that don't put it on the backs of the taxpayers. Thank you. All right, all in favor? Aye. Aye, Aye four zero. All right, we have uh, 48. Your favorite. Yeah. Did we place it yet? Or? Uh, let's, this is a place and uh, support. It wasn't ready. Mr. So. Chair, I move that we uh, place Article 48 Supplemental Appropriation for Judah Eldridge <coughs> property on the warrant and vote to accept and adopt a, an estimated figure of $750,000? Uh, 400000 Four, $400,000? Yeah. Okay, yeah. Uh, total cost. The total cost is. Second. Okay, moved and seconded, and this is uh, 28 acres out in East Tower, which off Seth Whitefield Road that four or five years ago we took by eminent domain, didn't act on it fast enough, and the value of land has gone up that much, so we need to finish this mm -hmm. this year, um, and we need to escrow that money. All in favor? Aye. Aye, 4-0. Next I have is 49. Play send. Yes. Uh, Mr. Chair, I move that uh, we place Article 49 transfer free cash to the stabilization funds and vote to accept and adopt at an estimated cost of $1,200,000. Second. Okay, moved and seconded. This is the balance of the free cash, uh, not the total balance, as you'll see in the explanation, but there's uh, quite a bit of money left in free cash, and it is the will of um, this board now, if we vote this, to put that into stabilization funds. Don? Just want to point out that uh, these rainy days do happen. That's what happened to us with COVID, and we were lucky enough to have the stabilization money available. And the trick always is to put more into it after you take a withdrawal out. So that uh, we have been very disciplined at doing this each year. Any further discussion? None. Nope. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Aye four zero. Article fifty. 50. Uh, Mr. Chair, I move that we place Article 50 fund prior years unpaid bills on the warrant and vote to accept and adopt it in the estimated amount of $10,696. That's a really precise estimate. <laughs> okay, moved and seconded. Any discussion? All in favor? Aye. Aye, four zero. And 54 cents. And uh, just so, do you have another one? That's nope, it. That's the last so one. So bringing back the ADU, what's the other one we're bringing back? Uh, 25. I don't remember what Oh, that's on the um, CPC on the Housing Trust. Okay, yeah. yeah. CPC Housing Trust. So we have two next week to vote, and then we're going to vote to close the warrant, and we'll have any general discussion next week on the warrant. Don? Who's the liaison to CPC? Um, I don't know, but I've been asked to go. Okay. Uh, Larry, oh, I am. Right? Yeah. So Larry should be there as I'll well. Yeah, yeah, please do. Yeah. Uh, I'm going to ask us some help on that. I'm prepared. I'm going to share, share notes with Mary. Uh, unfortunately, my brother-in-law passed away last night. I will be there. Oh. And so we have a, uh, at the funeral that day. I hope to join by. So if you're around. Yeah. Okay. He, would, he would be appearing as a trustee anyway, so you, you uh, appearing as a member of the board of selectmen would be perfectly fine. I'm going to share my notes with you guys. I'm putting together on that. Okay. Okay. F. Good. Okay, so discussion on additional material to be included in the warrant. Anything other than what we discussed last week? Nope. We'll have that conversation again before yeah. we close the warrant next week. And then discussion on authorizing town administrator to be the assigned individual for grant programs funds, including American Rescue Plan Act, ARPA, and related pandemic funds. 
minutes. And I would take a motion on that, but ultimately um, I get the majority of those emails and I don't write grants and, and I answer my emails as quickly as I can, but this would put this on the town administrator to be the assigned person yeah. so that he can sign for us on grants and whatnot. So moved. Okay. Second. Okay, it's been moved and seconded to... Authorize the town administrator to be assigned the individual for grant programs funds, including the ARPA and related pandemic funds. Perfect. Uh, any discussion? All in favor? Aye. Aye. 4-0. Can I motion on G? Mr. Chair, I move that we vote to approve the new 2023 seasonal common vintners license for Seagulls Suite LLC doing business as Seagulls Suites 537 Route 28. Second. Okay. Moved and second. Any discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 Four zero. H. Mr. Chair, I move that we vote to approve uh, the following 2023 season Vittler's uh, license renewals. Uh, uh, Schoolhouse Ice Cream and Yogurt LLC at 749 Route 28. Second. Moved and seconded. Any discussion? All in favor? Aye. Aye. 4-0. Aye. I'd pick aye and I'll take one through five as one motion. Okay, Mr. Chair, I move that we approve the following 2023 seasonal on-premise liquor license renewals as follows. At one, Ember Pizza doing business as Ember Pizza, 600 Route 28. Two, Pelham on, on Earl Operating LLC doing business as Pelham on Earl, 30 Earl Road. Three, Ashwood Food Service Incorporated doing business as Jake's at Cranberry Valley, 183 Oak Street. Uh, four, Sacratucket Snack Shack LLC doing business as Dockside, 71528 Unit A. And five, the Port Restaurant and Bar Incorporated at 541 Route 28. Second. Moved and second. Any discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 Four zero. Uh, Selectman's report. Larry. Uh, none. Don. None. Mary. None. Can I get a motion to adjourn. So moved. Second. Uh, all in favor? Aye. 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 Four zero two. <coughs>